on. Or are we having our other intro? That was a hum. That was a, <laughs> that was a hum. The world's hum. Dun, 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 dun. Um, That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. <laughs> God, oh, my talents, my talents are wasted. <laughs> they really are. Yeah, you should have stayed in the police. <laughs> oh, I should have stayed somewhere. Anyway, so yeah. Good evening, one and all. Welcome to the rabbit hole, where Burrow has started a little earlier this this evening because, um, believe it or not, Ben and I will be live at ten and going on to the wee small owls. As we await with with um, bated breath the <laughs> results. God, we're so screwed. <laughs> we're just the United Kingdom might as well just chuck it in the loo and flush flush it down the toilet. <laughs> ah, yeah. dear, I don't envy you having to listen to all of that nonsense. So yeah, I know, but you know, well, I, 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 I'm used to. It. I've been listening to Ben for two years, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Right, I so could l- do. I could do with a few drinks, uh, Brett. Mate, you're right, but unfortunately, I'm off the drink. I'm trying to lose weight. Although, I, although, <laughs> look, rules are made to be broken, and the exceptions are allowed to be made, especially when it comes to listening to cockwombles on election night. That's- <laughs> That's true. It's an early one, but it's true. Um, yeah, you're you're right. And um, my wife that dragged me to Booker this morning, and we ended up with oh, we ended up with a, a fantastic buy. We got a pork belly for nine quid. Oh, that's good. Yeah, but I mean a whole pork belly. Oh wow! Like this long. <laughs> right. I, like okay. Five kilos of meat. Bloody for hell. Nine quid. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And pork belly is so good. It's, oh, it's no. it's so gorgeous. much. You can do so many different things with it, too. You Muslims out there, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> I say, when I go to Egypt, it, it's I, if I'm on. If I'm on a week's holiday, I don't really notice it. If I'm mm. if I'm there for two weeks, after a week, I'm craving bacon like a crazy yeah. person. Yeah. You can't trust anyone that doesn't drink, eat bacon, drink bacon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's gonna be Get a the liquidizer. Get the liquidizer out. I'm going to liquidize some bacon. <laughs> Ew. Oh, God. Right. The hum. The hum. So this thing all started with localized hums, didn't it? You know, like mm. the Taos hum, the Windsor hum, the, yeah. the Bristol hum, um, the Largs hum. There's hums all over the world. Yeah, it, and, it's and then there's it, the world hum. And did you know there's a world hum database? That I didn't know. So there you go. I mean, it, it's amazing the things you learn. Hold on a second. Um. Oh, I've stupidly not added the photograph. Allow me to do that as we chat aimlessly to each other. Um. So yeah, there's a. <laughs> There's a world hum, uh, and there's a database. The guy that started it, oh, good grief, give me a second. I've, I'm, I'm, I'm no Joe Biden, but I am swiftly getting there. <laughs> I am swiftly getting there, indeed. There we go, the hum map. It's a coming. There we go. Right, so this is identified sources of the hum. The world hum, okay. As you can see, there's quite a few of them. Now, you may notice that many of them are the predominant. The predominant reports are in English-speaking countries. That's because, until very recently, the website was in English only. <laughs> <laughs> But as they've changed it, it started to, um, they've started to come in from other places. So you can see that the hum isn't really, it's not really, um, it's not focused on one particular area. No. It's all over. Although, I mean, there are, there are some distinct places where um, 
as you say, places like this, Windsor, Bristol, Kokomo in Indiana, Auckland, mm-hmm. Largs in Scotland, Sydney, yep. Bondi in Australia, uh, Sausalito, California, Woodland, Washington, Viborg, Denmark, Viborg, Viborg, don't know, I might be mangling that one, Hythe in Hampshire, mm-hmm. um, and Taos, Taos um, and that isn't even the only location in New Mexico. So, I, I mean, a, a bit of cursory research kind of reveals that it's a, a complete mystery. I mean, there's there's a lot of well, some like, some some of them have been kind of narrowed down to particular things, like the Largs home. There's a good chance it's to do with the nuclear power plant that's just round the corner. Sure. Um, the Windsor home. There's uh, for some reason. A lot of the people in Windsor uh, seem to report a hum at 120 hertz. And this is Windsor, Canada, I think. And that's the mains frequency. So they're mm-hmm. maybe hearing that. But the, the hum is this, it's a low frequency uh, noise that people identify and say they can hear. They can't really tie it down to an area and... And there was this guy, this Dr. McPherson guy in Canada, decided to start trying to track it down. And he turned all the power off in his house and the hum got louder. You know? He went inside in his car and the hum didn't go away. So he did all these things and started driving about at night and you know, driving up logging trails, driving into cities. And he couldn't he couldn't avoid the hum. It was always there. So there's been a number of different things. Like um I mean the thing is, there's only two to four percent of people in the world can hear the hum. So, are they attuned to it? Well, I mean, there were some theories that I came across while I was exploring that suggest that perhaps some people are um, more sensitive to electromagnetic radiation than others. Well, well that's it, a good it's, point. It's perhaps those people that can hear the hum. Mm-hmm. I did also investigate whether there was any connection with the Schumann resonance, resonance because that, that's a very low frequency as well. Um, and there are others that have postulated there might be a connection, but there's no, um, there's no actual proof of a link. Um, and, I mean, machinery, it's possible that in certain parts of the world, maybe the ground conducts that vibration more efficiently so if you have a power plant or some sort of other industrial plant that's mm-hmm. quite far away so far away that you wouldn't necessarily automatically infer a link um but that that somehow is being sent through the earth I don't know it's, yeah. it's well, one of those fascinating mysteries yeah there's been been loads of um there's been loads of things about it and loads of uh, investigations it even appeared in the x files the home did it I don't remember yeah. that one. Uh, David Duchovny, I think, said the te- he mentioned the Teos home because I think they were looking into that other phenomenon, the the bang, you know, the, the loud banging mm. noise that I think that was in Pennsylvania or something. And they never ever tracked that one down. So some of the some of the things that have been suggested for the hum, particularly the large one, <laughs> that's fish. Schools of fish rubbing against each other. <laughs> what? <laughs> Schools of fish? Uh, uh, no. No. Yeah, no, no, seriously. <laughs> who the hell suggested that one? That's know. absurd. That's absurd. That that's is... that that's like a that's like a five bottle of whiskey idea or something <laughs> stupid. <laughs> what the hell? Fish rubbing yeah. together. Yeah, Harold says the Teos hum was mentioned on the X Files. Me, uh, Stuart Campbell says, me and the wifey hear it all the time here in Derby, UK. Well, that may be a localised hum. So we've got to differ- we, we do have to diff- we do have to differentiate between the localised hum and the world hum. Oh, uh, yeah. Brit, Brit Max thinks it's actually S- Scully's nips that's to blame. <laughs> Don't start on that one again. Have you seen them? I'm... I'm not commenting. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm oh, speechless. Dear. I don't know what to say. Right. Um, so what else? Where else are we? 
Matthew Blackman says he's in Bristol. He'd never heard of this, but my already existing tinnitus has got lots worse in the last year. Well, tinnitus, tinnitus is um, well, right. There's a couple of reasons for that, Matthew. One, you're getting older. I hate to tell you, but you are, and your tinnitus will probably get worse. Um, two, people that get older get tinnitus if they didn't have it before. Um, three, tinnitus is a much higher frequency than the hum. The hum's very low frequency. You know, I think we're talking. Although there are similarities, I mean. Oh yeah, in yeah. Terms of there are. Of course there are. Because I mean, I have I have tinnitus that goes up and down. Oh, um, I have tinnitus. I have tinnitus as well. And and, and, and I, I sometimes. Yeah, I sometimes wonder if it's not connected to um, solar storms and the, the the weakening electromagnetic field around the planet. Just mm. a pet pet theory. It could be a pet theory, um, but. But it's age, mm. possibly scuba diving as well. But it, it's, I mean, so the thing is that they're not exactly the same, and the sound, the, the 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 frequency is different. But the fact that some people hear it and some don't, and that do the people who hear it hear it everywhere, or is it just in certain locations? Well, they hear it, but it's very very faint, so they they, they tend to only notice it when it's quiet. Well, there's the, there's, the fact is that the planet is a massively electrical thing. We're yeah, all electrical. Is, yeah, we are. Sound, sound, sound vibrations are effectively vibrations in the air, which could theoretically... I'm not saying they're electrical, but it, it's... I don't know. Things operate on levels that we're not aware of right now. <laughs> I'm gonna have to put this comment up. It's hurrying. It's it's <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> I get tinnitus after hearing Ben on the show. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, yeah, he can be a bit shouty. We're trying to beat that out of him. <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> the bloop. Well, the bloop. The, the bloop's actually a thing as well because you've heard that, you know, that bloop noise the, in the the ocean. Have you heard it? No. You need to. You need to hear the bloop. Um, but yeah, is, is Adam. Adam, see if you can get us a link to the bloop. A water bubble in the ears. Oh no, it's mental. It's um, it was really loud. I think because it got picked up by like underwater sonar, or submarine detectors, or something. Right, anyway, where were we? Uh, natural well, gas pipelines. I don't know. Well, yeah, some of the some of the explanations are electrostatic discharges. Mm -hmm. Did you know there are eight million lightning strikes in the world every day? I didn't know what the exact number was, but I knew it was eight a lot. Eight million. And every and also Ben Davidson day. over at Suspicious Observers is always talking about the Global electromagnetic circuit. Um, oh yeah. It, does he call it the no? Global electromagnetic something. But there's there's electricity that comes in at the poles from the sun and from uh -huh. um, space, yeah. and that gets charged bounced. particles. Yeah, charged particles, yeah. and they yeah. basically get funneled in at the poles. Mm -hmm. They do. And then that that energy has to get dissipated because the Earth is basically a giant capacitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's also where you sometimes get um, lightning that goes upwards. Well, there's, there's... Light, lightning usually does go upwards. It's just it travels that fast that you can't see it. Um, you get a leader coming down, and then the bolt comes from the ground up. Yeah, but with, in some cases, there's there's ground there's ground something lightning that doesn't actually have a leader that's coming from the clouds, and the, it basically just goes straight up there was some videos circulating of a volcano that i can't remember where it was but there was that was a brilliant video of this uh upward directed lightning um and it's it's crazy so then we, we're talking about levels of elect electromagnetic charge and charged particles and stuff that are actually difficult to comprehend on a mm -hmm. on a planetary scale so so um, the, the the chat room are discussing tinnitus, which which is a valid problem, and and tinnitus is suffered by up to eighty five percent of the population at some point or another. 
Um, so there are a number of ways of reducing tinnitus temporarily, right? Uh, if you stick your fingers in your ears for a couple of minutes, right, <laughs> and pull them out, you may find it has gone away temporarily, right? Then there is um, massaging the, see the, the back of your head where either side of where your spinal cord goes into your head, if you massage there, if you give that a good massage for five or ten minutes or whatever, then it can go away as well. Um, so there's quite a few different techniques for getting rid so of tinnitus. So it could be stress related as well, because th oh, those be those okay. muscles that you mentioned, that's that's where a lot of us hold our hold our stress and tension in the in mm -hmm. the shoulders and yeah. neck. Yeah, and and let's face it, if you're going to have stress and tension, it's going to be right now, isn't it? With the threat uh, of nuclear th thermal nuclear war hanging <laughs> over you. Yeah, especially when you know your country is led by just people who've got no business running countries. And well, well it, it's like when you you saw that tweet today, Ed, when that guy said, um, you know, what does uh, what does America do that the or Britain doesn't really do anything that's better than America. And I said, well, at yeah. least at least our prime minister can still string a sentence together. <laughs> well, I, I kind of, I, I have my regrets about tweeting that because the, my, my notifications have just gone absolutely, totally potty. Um, and there's arguments starting between people. And I, I never get involved in, in stuff like that because life's too short to argue with people oh you Twitter, just but... throw on the hand grenade and then run away <laughs> well, not That's... intentionally yeah, I, all i was yeah. doing was pointing out that english you know, breakfasts are better than american yeah, breakfasts but you know what they call people that do that trolls <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, i wasn't trying to troll anyone i was just making a point about breakfast yeah, and it, okay. it's it, but it's one of those times twitter is a funny place because you can kind of you can post something in it you, that you think is really cool or retweet something you think is really cool and it doesn't get any traction and you just bash something out and send well, it and suddenly your your stuff's going crazy right so i hate to break it to you Ed, but you, you and i are probably much of this but we're, we're, we're not that distant in age right um, and and outlook really because we're both pretty um we both come from a similar kind of IT-ish background. Mm. And um, I hate to break it to you, mate, but we're really not fucking cool. <laughs> and I'm... Said so, so anything that you think is cool, you probably need to sit back and go, I think that's pretty cool. I'm going to tweet that and then go, hold on, maybe I need to check. <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, no, that's that is the beauty of Twitter. Is you just say whatever you like, and I hope you don't I hope you don't get I hope you don't get suspended, which is not that hard these days. But no, I had I was making no assumptions that I was cool. I might be cool in my own head, but I don't Ooh. care. And it's one of those who cares what other people think in that regard, anyway. Yeah, B twelve don't work for me. It's really Ray, not that important. Ray says B twelve will cure tinnitus. So don't work for me. Plus, people who listen to nonsense like Taylor Swift have got no business accusing anyone of being uncool. But, 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 <laughs> but, but, but there wasn't, who was it that was at the table? Was it Keith? Was it Keith? Oh, I... <sighs> was it Keith Starmer? Or... Well, no, but we've had, we've had two weeks of those political idiots. Just, it, it's, they've got no ideas, particularly the Tories. No, they, no, the they, best, the best one has to be just, Davy. <laughs> What's Ed Davey on? What's he trying to prove? I mean, the guy goes the, bungee jumping. I, I, I mean, he goes bungee jumping. I saw him dancing. He's, he's like, what is he trying to prove? The guy's. I mean, he looks like an egg oh. on legs, and and here he is doing all these stupid. And see the bungee jump that didn't that didn't really end well. He just ended up hanging himself upside down for a couple of minutes, didn't he? Like when Boris got stuck on the. Remember when Boris gets stuck on the zip line? Doo -doo -doo. I've got then, a perfect uh, cutout of that with the, with the zip line. I've used that repeatedly in memes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, moving on. 
Uh, mm. Other explanations are earth rumbles. Well, we talked about that, you know, like um, earthquakes and things, but that would that shouldn't really be that consistent, should it? Should it? Well, should it? No, not necessarily. I mean, not not unless it's some because it 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 doesn't necessarily have to be an earthquake or a volcano. Yeah. It could be some geological process that's happening all the time. Maybe even just the the mantle moving around the crust or whatever, mm -hmm. but maybe there's some sort of process in the earth which is causing a particular vibration that certain people are sensitive to. Yeah. I think um, the, the fact okay. that it's the fact that there's only a small proportion of people that actually hear it suggests a definite link between some sort of physiological difference that that exists within them, some sort of heightened sensitivity to <laughs> something electricity oh. or whatever uh, right okay wind shear wind shear yeah the jet stream um basically rubbing up against the lower atmosphere i uh, as good as I'm, I'm, th I'm throwing possible explanations at you right well the thing is because it's low vibration yeah it might be something that's actually coming it 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 sound it <laughs> It just feels more like it's coming from underneath than above. Okay. Um, harp? Uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe harp is call it causing the bloody tinnitus as well. <laughs> Could be. Maybe, yeah, maybe the harm and the tinnitus. Harp's meant to be off. Is it not meant to be off? I thought it was off. Well, I've just seen videos. that The, the installation in Alaska was um, shut down. Uh, well, it was. I think it was transferred over to... Yeah. academics for it research was, uh, yeah. but i mean i've i've seen two i've seen two videos on twitter in the last three or four days of different arrays there's someone that discovered one on some totally remote island in the south pacific or south atlantic somewhere just just hell and gone from anywhere else where there's a, there's a massive array mm -hmm. and then there was another one I can't remember from where, but it's basically like a massive wall, which could also potentially be some sort of oh, sophisticated oh. over the horizon sort of radar, which, yeah. Um, but I'm not convinced that it's been shut down. In fact, I, I suspect that once, once they proved the technology in Alaska, they realized that the Alaskan installation was getting far too much attention from people like us. Um, and then decided to just shut it down and moved it to other more secret places or yeah. re more remote places. Because I mean, if you're, if you're going to influence the ionosphere and in so doing create some sort of changes pretty much anywhere in the world by bouncing shit around, then do you necessarily need to have it in that one place? You could always put it, find better locations for them. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's um here's the next one. Uh, Dumbs stroke underground alien dwellers, or <laughs> hollow earth. If we're going to extend that yeah, that particular yeah. rabbit hole down a bit further, I mean, hollow earth. the deep underground military bases are definitely a thing. I mean, you, it would kind of explain why people who hear it when they move away from certain locations hear it less. Well, it explains um, a localized one, but not the world hum. Well, yeah, I mean, I. Who knows? I mean, the world hum. I. That has to be related to something electromagnetic. Okay. That's. Well, we'll, we'll go on to possible. Um, I've got I've got possible explanations, and then I've got um, reasons reasons for coming to a conclusion at the end. I think I think we can actually come to a conclusion at the end of this one. Um. So. Tech, i.e. Well, 5G, 4G, 3G, whatever. Um, I mean, that, that could potentially be... It could be. A cause. Think, I've, I've wondered whether that's not a cause of tinnitus as well. Yeah, but, but you've got to remember that people have effectively been reporting the hum since 1700s, before the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. So probably not tech. Anyway, um, or is it indeed self-generated? 
Uh, self-generated in what sense? Well, they're like, like they're hearing tinnitus. their own heartbeat, or no, like tinnitus. Tinnitus is self-generated. Um, yeah, but is it? Because it's something that is well, because it's. I mean, it, it's like we were talking last week about how what we perceive as reality is just electrical signals interpreted by our, by our brains, but in every single case, that ele- that that sensation mm-hmm. is coming from somewhere. It's like when you touch something, when you see something, when you hear something, when you taste something, etc. They, they're all outside stimuli. I, I mean, unless our brains are somehow making that shit up and making it sound like it's a high pitched sound or a low pitched sound. I, I, I'm not dismissing it as a possibility. I mean, the human brain is. Yeah. Is is, an, is an amazing indeed, thing. Well, we have discussed the human brain on a number of occasions, and we're still to come to a conclusion. Well, it sounds given given how well our brains work and how good they are at doing what they're doing, making up random sounds to drive themselves crazy <laughs> seems a bit stupid. <laughs> that there's no. Yeah. Okay. But right. Okay. Because that's effectively what it's doing. If it's oh yeah, it's... well, not not necessarily because tinnitus could be. Do they not reckon that tinnitus is, is to do with damaged, um, you know, the little hails in your canal, canali? Um, is it not to do with damaged hails in your canali? That's possible. Yeah, I think so. But anyway, right, so here's a couple of things about the hum that are peculiar to it, are peculiar to people who can hear mm-hmm. the hum. And remember, it's only 4, 4% or so of the population that can hear the hum. I don't think I can hear the hum. You hear the hum? No. No, no, at least I can't hear it. Maybe it's there. If there was, an, there was, if there was no tinnitus, I might hear that. Well, the tinnitus <laughs> is in a completely different range. I mean, my tinnitus is quite high up. I would say it's quite high up the frequency but, range. Right. No, I don't hear anything yeah. in the low frequency. So, um, so after after two hours or more in an aircraft, the hum tends to go away for two to three days. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, that would suggest something from the planet, because if you di- disconnect yeah. yourself from the planet, yeah. But why would why would you not hear it for two or three days once you're back on the planet? Good, good uh, yeah, very good point. Um, the hum can be heard by those who are deaf or who have lost their hearing. Oh, that must suck. Yeah. God, imagine being completely deaf and just hearing this background hum. You'd go insane. Yeah. You would literally just lose, you'd lose your marbles. As Ray says, um, threshold differences may account for the change in the the hum after you've been in the air. Um, Different people hear different frequencies. So what the World Hum Database does... (laughs) Is it ask you to go on to an online tone generator and find out, find a tone that matches your hum? You know, just zip up and down until you match your hum, and that may be quite a good, that may be quite a good exercise. Maybe we should all do this. All our tinnitus sufferers, get on and um, get onto an online tone generator and see if you can identify what frequency your tinnitus is at. Because if it's all the same. Then we've got we've got something, right? But if it's all different, it's probably self generated. But imagine if it was all the same. Then we would have something to investigate. Mm. But you would think that if it was surely someone's already done this sort of experiment. Why? Why do you think anyone would be so stupid as to consider it? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll, I'll give true. you I'll give you that one. <laughs> so, I mean, the thing is, you're not going to get universities and um, PhDs yeah, but, and all that looking at this kind of stuff because they're not going to get funding on that. But I don't sp- feel like spending hours listening to a tone generator. You don't have to. Oh, for God's sake, man. You've only got to whip up and down the frequencies a few times to find the, the one that matches your tinnitus. I'm not asking you to spend hours. <laughs> a couple of minutes at most. <laughs> If you can't spare a couple of minutes, then you're no good to me, man. 
Oh, dear John and his quest for science. So, so, so get back to me, people. You get there, get me the frequency. So there you go. Harold's <laughs> done. His, his is one kilohertz, right? That's, that's, that's good, Harold. Excellent. So we've got one. We've got one. See, we've got a result in already, Ed. <laughs> so after this show, you get onto a tone generator and work yes, out where boss. we are. See, the, the, Harold says it takes like a minute. A minute. <laughs> A one okay. kilohertz minute. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> right, next one. Next one. Um, it's not EMF. It's not EMF. It's not EMF, right, because... Excuse me, I've got to send my wife a picture. <laughs> she wants a picture of the pork belly. But we're specifically talking about the hum... <laughs> not being right so the hum um the hum is not emf because dr mcpherson right went yeah just fucking slow down <laughs> uh, so dr mcpherson went to the what's it called why, why have i got no pictures right can you tell your wife we're doing a podcast? Yeah, uh, yeah. Fuck up. It's a piece forget of pork it. for crying forget out loud. It, yeah, forget <laughs> it. Um, right. So the uh, Dr. McPherson built a box. He built a mild steel box that eradicated all frequency, all EMF frequencies. Right. He then yeah. climbed into said box. <laughs> right. <laughs> and to be fair, it just. It did just look like a giant steel coffin <laughs> with a, a hole in the top that he covered with a steel plate. So he best basically sealed himself in a electromagnetically dead zone, which was a steel coffin. And he can still hear the hum. Right. Okay. Right. So the hum is not EMF. I think, we, I think, well, he went in there with three other people. So it was a fairly big steel coffin, but I, I think we, it's quite conclusive that we have a number of people who have now identified that it can't be EMF because they completely, they completely sealed themselves off from EMF. But with that box, did they also take into account some sort of low frequency vibration coming up through the ground? Was it, was, was the, the box itself on rubber feet or anything like that i wonder but that would be that that wouldn't be emf that would be no, no i know but i'm just wondering what right, else so what apart I'm saying from EMF, is the box is, might have shielded them from well the box has shielded them from emf so that's that now they took another guy who could hear the hum in fact i think was it see nbc or something did it in way back in the 90s they took a guy down a mine right because they thought if they went, if they took him down a mine, he wouldn't, you know, disused mine. He wouldn't be able to hear the hum because he'd be shielded by all the tons and tons of rock above him. Mm -hmm. And he said, "No, if anything, it's got louder." Right, so he could still hear the hum, but it was got it got louder when he was at the bottom of the mine. Right. Okay. Probably because it's quieter. Yeah. Or right. he's he's closer to. If the, the source is coming the from source. the ground, then he's well, closer I, to that. I think he's pretty really, 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 really fucking close to the sound. Because I think what we're kind of working out here is it's not a sound. I think I think it is internally generated. I think right. it's, it's tinnitus, right? Well, it's just, just a different, different form of tinnitus. It's just a different form. And the thing is, if I said to you... You know, if, if people say to you they've got tinnitus or they've, they can hear a high-pitched whine, right? Um, first of all, you'll say, is your wife home? <laughs> <laughs> and then, then they'll say, <laughs> then they'll say, <laughs> as a, so you, you go to the doctor and say you can hear this high-pitched whine in your ears all the time, you'll say you've got tinnitus, right? So right. generally everybody believes you if you've got tinnitus, Right. But because because eighty five percent of the population have had tinnitus at some point or other, people believe that quite readily, you know. However, 
if I was to turn around to you and say, I can see purple striped rats running up and down the walls, <laughs> right? And you looked at said wall and said, well, I can't. You're obviously hallucinating. Right? <laughs> now, well, you can have auditory well, hallucinations. Yeah, well, you can. But the question is, why isn't it the you that could be hallucinating? The purple striped rats may be running up and down the wall and you're not <laughs> seeing them. <laughs> right. Okay. That, no. That's just, yeah, yeah. Unless, I mean, well, unless the each, purple... Each, each incidence is as likely as the, the last. Yeah. You and know, I guess really? in, in some, some other dimension of space-time, there may well be a universe that is bleeding into ours that has purple striped freaking yeah. rats in it. So, uh. so anyway, so, so what happens then is people, when people say they hear the hum, a lot of people say, well, you're, you're imagining it, it's all in your mind, right? No, I don't think it is in your mind. I think you're actually experiencing a proper audit, not an, you're, you're experiencing an auditory sensation, but I don't think it's caused by an audio sound. I think it's caused by your body. Your anatomy has gone awry somewhere, right? Yeah, but what? Well, the same as tinnitus. If tinnitus is caused by dodgy hair follicles, there's no reason why you can't have a, a, a persistent low-frequency hum caused by some damage to an auditory nerve. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I yeah. accept that. You sure. Know? And it seems to be the probably the most sensible and simplest solution, other than the fact that there are hollow earth dwellers <laughs> going by. By. Maybe that. Maybe it's under underground people having a rave or something. Beats and tape says you've got fourteen thousand six hundred in the hearing test. That's not what we want to know. If you've got, if you've got <laughs> tinnitus, match the frequency. Don't tell me your maximum hearing frequency. Good grief, man! Nobody <laughs> cares about that. I tell you what, I did notice last night though. I noticed because I, 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 I usually drift off to sleep listening to podcasts, usually around stupid subjects like this, um, and and um, I noticed if I lie on my left. I can't hear as well. I think I'm starting to lose some hearing in my right ear. You might be going a bit deaf. What? <laughs> <laughs> I nearly got you. I nearly got you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christ, even even on even after at least a large glass and a half of red wine, I'm still not that slow. <laughs> oh, you weren't far away. You weren't far away. <laughs> Oh, uh, dear. <clears throat> but it's, I mean, the, the whole thing is completely fascinating. I mean, it is, I, it is. and whether it's caused by, I mean, <sighs> trying to think of this in an Occam's razor, simplest explanation is the most, it's probably the most likely. Um, but none of the explanations in this case are particularly simple. But of all of them, possibly some sort of, auditory slash nerve issue yeah. in maybe it's some sort of congenital thing maybe a certain proportion of the population are born with some kind of deformity in there just a tiny tiny little deformity i don't know in their eardrum or, or mm -hmm. some Could some be. part of their auditory nerves or something which which means that that they perceive this hum does it I didn't actually did check this in my research, but did people hear it for their whole lives? Do kids hear it? No. If you look at when people experience the hum, it seems to get more prevalent as one gets towards middle age, which tends to go with the, it's probably your body mm. that's self-generating it because, you know, tinnitus also has the same kind of bell curve it goes towards. The, the people in middle age and, and of course it drops off as people get older because people die and that's why it drops off <laughs> and it's also you have to you have to wonder whether it's exactly the same hum 
um, because obviously people perceive because different people will perceive tinnitus in a different way, um, and a low frequency hum. Mm. It may well be a group of different frequencies rather than just one as well. It could be. It could be. Could be. So um, it sounds like um, sounds like Jillian has got tinnitus as well, by the sound of things. White noise, yeah. I mean, tinnitus is just like a a constant. Mm. Well, tinnitus is the high pitch, and this well, this yeah. this hum is is the low, low pitch. pitch. Yeah, and... so a white noise is a, more of a high pitch than a low pitch, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I mean, it would make sense that if if yeah. one is if one is caused by some sort of damage, then the other one might be as well. Yeah. And again, so. it could be age. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, well, it yeah, could it just could be. be physiological changes relating to, as as yeah, the, the slow creep towards middle age, as they say. Yeah, and and to be to be honest, you get used to it. It used to drive me nuts, but you get used to it. You kind of tune it out. Your brain kind of just tunes mm. it out, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, with the tinnitus, it also it changes. It's not. It's not constant. Yeah, sometimes it's louder than, mm. than others. Other times it's it's um, right in your face, and mm -hmm. some sometimes you you forget it's there. You know, just to, it might even have gone because you've forgotten about it, and then it'll it'll wiggle its way back in. Maybe this maybe this physiology maybe it's actually a combination of an external source like. The massive increase in EMF that we're all subjected to now, causing some kind of damage in the auditory nerves, which are massively sensitive to such things. Yeah. Um. Because I I wonder if, I mean, you're saying people heard the hum going way back when. Um. Seventeen sixty. Seventeen sixty. Yeah, well, they used to report it as hearing like a far off giant swarm of bees, because you didn't have much to, mm. you know, to 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 thing it against. Because I mean, people nowadays would say it's like a it's like a truck droning in the background, you know, mm -hmm. that never gets further away or never changes, or or like a, a you know like a diesel train idling somewhere, that kind of thing. Maybe maybe. All the theories about Hollow Earth are correct. Maybe, maybe they are. It's. I mean, that's why these 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 things are interesting to ponder because there's no. There, there is actually no answer for it, um, and just throwing a subject around uh, can be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't. I mean, I I got no answers for it. My my theories about Schumann resonance and things like that. Um, well, that's. Human resonance resonance isn't so much a noise though, is it? Is a... uh, well, it's the what, extremely what? low frequency portion of the Earth's electromagnetic field spectrum, caused by global lightning discharges in the cavity formed by Earth's the Earth's surface and the ionosphere. Um, fundamental frequency is seven point eight three hertz, with harmonics at approximately fourteen point three, twenty point eight, twenty seven point three. 33.8 hertz um and it's the, the idea about that it's got something to do with the hum is goes back to people some people being more sensitive to the extremely low frequencies yeah um but the human resonance is global whereas the taos hum is localized i mean it yeah, could well, be that, 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 that that's correct because that's that's a local hum and they kind of I don't know if they've found the reason for the terrorist hum, but there are other localized hums where they have found reasons, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the other thing is, I mean, what we what you were talking about the global hum, maybe that's the human resonance. Well, um, is, and is the, it the other frequency though? What's the frequency? Well, that the the thing is that the frequency of the human resonance is generally below the range of human hearing, but. That's not to say that some people might not have a range that is lower but then than the again, average is the or Schumann, higher than is, the average. Is the human resonance, is, is, it, is it an electromagnetic wave? Because the uh, box test rules it out then. 
which uh, it's an electromagnetic resonance. Yeah, so I think the box test rules that out. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, although it doesn't necessarily rule out the human resonance being connected to tinnitus. I've wondered that sometimes. No, no, but then again, tinnitus is much higher frequency, is it not? Uh, yeah, generally. So we seem to be going around in circles. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so basically we don't 100% know, but we pretty much think that both tinnitus and the hum are the human condition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or something something similar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, just a, a fairly short and sweet one this week. Yeah. Yeah, well... They Which helps. got, they got, the wonderful election results show coming up at ten o'clock. <laughs> Should be riveting. Get out of people. <laughs> oh dear, yeah, elections. We promised we weren't going to talk about that, so I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Oh, so <laughs> apparently Ray, Ray has uh, baby seagulls outside his window. Oh, that's fun. No. <laughs> yeah. Don't want that. Oh, Spencer. Spencer says he sometimes heals a hum. The vacuum cleaner. Left Ray, on just hope that they never the learn to start tapping. Never found out what the sauce is. Hmm, interesting. I used to hear music when people around me couldn't hear music. Yeah, you know, and it would right. be like it would be like you know how you can just hear something. It's on the right, right on the cusp, and well, I would, could... I would be lying in bed or something, and go, "Who the hell is playing music at this time of the morning or something like that?" Did you have more sensitive hearing as a child? Yeah, I think so. Oh, while well, we're talking about noises, that hilarious story that where, um, in New York, where they found um, the 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 Jewish tunnels leading here, there, and everywhere. Um, oh, yeah. and, and then this guy comes up on Twitter because, like, six months previously, he posted, he's posted saying, I've got, I've got Jewish people in my walls. I can hear Yiddish. And he was right. Yeah, but he, there was a massive pile on of, of yeah, everyone accusing him of being an anti Semite. And then when it was released in the news, I he tweeted you. again. Yes, I told you I'm not an anti Semite. There were Jews in my walls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's one of the funniest things I've seen on Twitter yeah. in a very long time. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Um, yeah, your your lady says there's always someone on her estate having either a party or play music. Yeah, people are. See, I, I'm not. I, I mean, they say people are social animals, but are we? Are we really? I mean, I hate people. <laughs> I mean, really, I do. The, old, I mean, the older the older I get, the the. <laughs> more I appreciate my own company put it that yeah. way yeah and people are always making annoying noises and things when really you just want to have a quiet life you know <laughs> I, I should probably live in the middle of a forest <laughs> and even then they'll be going who knocked that fairkin tree down <laughs> did you see the tree that got hit by lightning no on Twitter there was a tree got hit by lightning on Twitter and it just disintegrated it just disappeared Jesus yeah no uh, no I'm John that's but, powerful lightning. Yeah, yeah. Well, the lightning is powerful. There's an awful lot of mega jewels on a lightning strike, mm. isn't there? Mm. And how many of them hit the earth every day, Ed? How many? Millions. No, how many? Come on, I told oh, you I earlier. Can't rem- I can't remember. Eight, I got this. eight million eight a million. day. Eight million a day. That's incredible. <laughs> Imagine if you could harness that. You wouldn't need but, any power stations. The planet, from our perspective, is rather large. Well, indeed it is, but imagine if you could harness that electrical power. Well, surely that... Maybe I mean, Tesla could. Yeah. Well, that's, that, why that's, got... that's the thing. And I mean, there's because when you actually stop and think about it, there is a massive amount of electrical power, both in the atmosphere, because if hot air, hot air and cold air bumping into each other can create thunderstorms and lightning then, I mean, it, it must, 
you, know, you get lightning coming up out of the earth. It's probably well. There's electric. a massive there's a massive potential difference, isn't there? Because the earth's mm. positive. Well, we've got and, positive and negative. And yeah, but is the earth mainly positive? And then for every, I think it's for every three feet you go up. It's something like is it ten volts or, or a volt or something? It's 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 a fairly substantial electrical voltage change between, mm. you know, here and fifty thousand feet. Yeah, but that's also why they have to when you get helicopters and stuff that land. Um, you have to, particularly if you have a helicopter landing on a ship, uh -huh. um, they they have yeah. to degauss it. Yeah. Um, and and neutralize the charge, particularly with helicopters, because the the rotor blades going through the air actually creates um, static. I think. Yeah, Do you remember and when you... people used to drive about and then they'd get out of the car and there'd be a static discharge between the car and themselves. Mm -hmm. And then people used to put all those rubber strips on the back of their cars so they would drag along the ground and earth their car as they were driving. You don't. Yeah, you, never, have... you never see them anymore. No, we have two shops. Two <laughs> shops in Brighton that that actually they have. A, there's one, one that's W. H. Smith, another that's Robert Dias, and they have staircases in that that I'm constantly getting static. Um, Walking staircases or escalators? No, 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 just a normal a, a really? staircase rail. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know whether it's just me or whether everyone gets that, but yeah. <laughs> right. Right. I think, I think we've done um, that one. Yeah, I think we've done it to death. So thank you very much, Ed. Uh, no, pleasure. Short and sweet. Oh, I don't know about... Well, yeah, it was, well, quite, it was actually not a bad one. It was all right. It's, that's it's, interesting. It's hard doing a rabbit hole when you're sober. I'll give you that. <laughs> and it's nothing to do with you. It's nothing to do with you, but I like... I like I like us to go off into one, you know, like our, when we go down our consciousness routes and that. Because mm. I think I I think they're they're great fun. But yeah, me too. People, no, I, I agree. people listening to us probably think, what are those two old boring buggers <laughs> talking about? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I, there's yeah. that as well. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, I like it. I like it. And um, and this one hasn't really allowed us to do that. And of course, we are time constrained on this one because. We've got to um, we've got to be ready for the big, the big election day disaster. <laughs> oh dear, yeah. So it's the British Grand Prix this uh, weekend, Ed. Is yes, there? I'm. I You're not really a Formula do. One fan, no. No, not really. Okay, um, yeah. Um, so What's remember, the, people. This Silverstone so, one. Yeah, the Silverstone one. So right. remember, people, like, share, subscribe because that costs you nothing. You can do that. Come on, you know you can. You know you want to. Um, so get more eyes on the channel. See if we can uh, build up a little bit. Uh, come back at just before 10 o'clock and we will be live streaming, me and Ben. Now, Ben has had a bit of a disaster. Um, I'll probably not mention it. But I'll, I'll, he probably will, so I'll leave it to him to tell you. Um, but yeah, he phoned me in a distressed condition. He's okay. His family are okay. Um, but something has occurred. That uh, I'm sure he'll be telling us at 10 o'clock. Uh, and in case he's late, that'll be why. But he is perfectly fine and untouched. Um but yeah. He's not been arrested or anything, has he? No, no, no. <laughs> nothing's happened to him or his family. Right. But um a disaster has occurred in the household. Um well oh it actually it actually happened in the backyard. So Oops. There we go. Well, I have why to don't choose. we say something Yazzie, why are you bashing on about chemtrails? This isn't a chemtrails exercise, my dear. <laughs> it just isn't. This is this is this is what were we talking about tonight? What were we talking about, Ben? No, you're not Ben, you're Ed. <laughs> the hum. I know we were talking about the hum. I'm at it. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not Joe Biden, but I am getting there. <laughs> so, Joe Biden's just... What did you think of that debate, Ed? Oh, my God, it was a disaster. Wasn't and it? They, 
and it was hilarious because there was nothing they could do to hide it. Oh, and they've they've basically been hiding his decline pretty much since he got elected. Well, you say hiding, right? How? Because <laughs> well, well, let's face it, anyone who has a pair of eyes and a pair of ears knows the man is a dementia case. So how have they... How, Tell me, how have the world's press not picked up on this? Well, because he never does, he hardly does any interviews. He hardly does any campaigning that's not in front of rich donors. He's always got someone to hold his hand. And I wouldn't be surprised if they have body doubles and stuff like that for the days that he is is really, really bad. But uh, I mean, he's not. This is this is not the leader of the free world. This is not someone oh, that you want to have not. control over nuclear oh, he's weapons. Gone. He's gone. He's gone. He's not going to control over his bladder, mate. Never exactly. Nuclear weapons. And and that then begs, begs the question of who's actually running the United States. And when you look at the potential candidates, they're all bloody disaster because they're all. Yeah, you know, I think Joe's running the United States at the moment. Oh my God! It's Just, well, okay. Or but maybe Hunter Biden. Jesus. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> I mean, not at it's this just point like in a clown world, it's like Zelensky, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. I mean, at this point in clown world, nothing would surprise me. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it certainly wouldn't. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Bada bada. Uh, chemtrails and the hum might be connected. No, 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 no. I don't think they had anybody flying around spraying chemtrails in the seventeen sixties. Yeah, that, that's that's correct thing. me it's, if I'm wrong, but you know, well, if it's something that's been heard by people going back hundreds of years, yeah, then then that kind of rules out a lot of modern, like EMFs, three G, four G, five G, etc. It's a human condition. That's what it is. Um, yeah, Trust I think this one. I, I think I think we have to conclude that it's part of the human condition until we. I need to get a gavel. <laughs> no, 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 because we, we rarely solve anything. And we haven't really on the one occasion that is... we could, I could go. <laughs> no, this is just you, you, this is you, just you jumping in there. Oh, and going, okay. I have the solution. The judge, the judge has spoken. <laughs> solved by. Uh, no, not even no? Judge Knapp has a gavel. Come on. No, he doesn't. I know. <laughs> judge Knapp has good though. He's excellent. Yeah, no. His... Well, actually, his, his guests are better. Because the judge doesn't really do much apart from try and sell you gold or silver. <laughs> well, he asks, he asks, <laughs> he asks good questions, but he's yeah, but he asks the same questions to every guest. Yeah, that's one thing that's a bit annoying about him is when you when you watch when you watch one, you could skip all his bits out, couldn't you? Yeah, no, I always do because there's only so many times in in a week that I can stomach listening to someone like Bibi Netanyahu. Yeah, yeah, aye, because he plays the same clips as well. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> Well, it's been oh. fun. Thank you, John. Good luck with fun. your uh, election Good. special later. Thank you, Ed. Um, and thank you, audience, as well. And and we'll we'll talk about something to talk about next week. Something yep. juicy. Yep, I'm trying to and pull I our don't fingers know where out. To go. A bit In quicker. fact, you people out there, you think about it. Send us some suggestions, perhaps. You know. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure there's some. You know where we are. We live bet. on Twitter. If you're listening, this is your moment. This is your moment. Um, right. And we're always up for ideas, so get in touch. Always. Always. We will embrace anything within reason. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> and as always, it's been great for you. Good evening. Welcome Good evening. one and all. Hello. And how are you, Ed? I'm really good, thank you. Yeah. Good, good. No, I've, I've had curry tonight. I went out to Shoreham for curry with a friend. It's my favourite uh, curry place on the south coast. So. But thankfully, smelly vision is not yet a thing, so we're oh, okay. That's such a good thing. Yeah, no, it's so good. You wouldn't want me breathing my, my curry breath all over you. Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. So if you're here looking for the news, you're in the wrong place, because tonight we're going down the rabbit hole, and we're going to discuss the multifaceted genius of Walter Russell. Aren't we? Yes, absolutely. Fine. I mean, I, I hadn't even heard of him until um, you mentioned it. Mm -hmm. So I did a bunch of research, and absolutely fascinating bloke. I mean, he was a polymath, born May nineteenth, eighteen seventy one, in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, he left school at age nine to support his family, 
worked various jobs in his youth, including as a church organist and a portrait painter. He gained recognition as a painter and sculptor in the early 1900s. Um, got married in 1983 um, and divorced in 1948. Um, now, he experienced a transformative illumination in 1921, which shaped most of his future work. A transformative um, illumination, you say? Well, that's that's kind of how how he describes it. Um, okay, and it, it's there's it's interesting because he was a com, he was a, a contemporary of Nikola Tesla, yeah. and there was a, a distinct spiritual element to Tesla's work as well because he Tesla always claimed that the um his ideas and his his kind of um insights came to him in the form of visions um, from mars no i don't think it was from mars tesla was really into um hindu mythology and meditation and yeah. all that kind of stuff um and so yeah i'm not sure exactly the precise nature of russell's transformative illumination i didn't really dig into that too much um but he did write numerous books on both cosmological and philosophical ideas. Um, he also developed theories on the nature of the universe, which completely challenged conventional scientific views. If you if you do any research on him, the first thing that you come across is this is not accepted by mainstream science. Um, but there's an elegance to his ideas. I mean, fundamentally, he created this concept called the electric universe, mm -hmm. um, which has a completely different um, uh, way of explaining reality. And then as opposed to um, the sort of gravitational theory, his, um, yeah, it was all about vortices, so spirals and electricity. And I mean, we can go into a little bit more detail about um Are we talking frequency and resonance as well there are well let, let's just go let, let's just go through it quickly um his concept of an electric universe was part of his alternative cosmology which diverges significantly from the mainstream uh -huh. um to give you a brief overview the first one was the primacy of electricity so russell proposed that electricity rather than gravity was the fundamental force shaping the universe well, it's a much stronger force. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he believed that all phenomena could be explained through electrical processes. Yeah. Um, electromagnetic creation. And it, it, in Russell's view, matter was created through electromagnetic processes rather than through gravitational collapse or nuclear fusion, as mm -hmm. described by um, conventional astrophysics. Now, there's, there's plenty of... There's, there's an increasing number of people who are saying that the sun, our sun, far from mm. being this giant ball of kind of nuclear fusion inferno, is is actually massively electrical. Well, and uh, yeah, and and uh, we, we we have probably touched on this before, mm. right? Yeah, no, we have. And and I think, um, in my view, and and of course, I I speak as a layman. But in my view, we, we we still don't actually know how the sun works, right? No. Because we we take readings from it, we get temperatures from it, we get the spectrum that it's giving out, both in visible light and in you know the the non visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, and we see things like sunspots and stuff like that. And yet we have this massive disparity between what we're told the temperature of the corona is, which is in millions of degrees, right? And the actual surface of the sun is only like 2,000. Mm. It's like, how does it get, how does it get, so if it's a fusion ball, right? How is it so hot in the center, right? Which then gets cooler on the outside towards the surface mm. and then gets massively warmer again once it's um, left the actual surface of the, yeah, of the um, of the gas, well, effectively it would be a gas giant, a star, wouldn't it? Mm. So, 
my thought was maybe it's like you know the plasma generators you get the ones you buy and you see the maybe it's just a big ball of plasma and it's in a current an elect pardon me an electric current that you can't see because it's not lit up well there's a galactic current sheath there's yeah well there is exactly that but so it, it stars are nothing but nodes in the current you know and be. basically they're just that's why and this would explain those ones that dim and brighten really quickly okay because there's no reason for a star to dim to almost nothing and then come back you know mm-hmm. because if it's burnt all its fuel how did it start burning fuel again you know but if it was a plasma ball and it had a dip in the current being supplied it would go it would be like turning down a light bulb it would turn yeah. on the dimmer switch wouldn't it and, yeah, and that other... could explain a lot of things. Sure. I mean, the other thing that's fascinating about the sun is the sunspots, because not all sunspots produce coronal mass ejections and mm-hmm. solar flares. And the ones that do, um, essentially, you generally see two sunspots close together. Mm-hmm. And one of them is always negative and one of them is always positive. Well, not always, but generally speaking, you have a negative one and you have a positive one. Yeah, and the coronal mass ejection is essentially some sort of spike that runs between the two, and that then blasts off. You 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 get um, mass ejected from the corona of the sun, but not all sunspots. When you when you actually look at the um, the sunspot viewer, mm-hmm. the ones that tend to produce big CMEs are the ones that instead of just being like a black dot, you have two black dots next to each other. They have they're kind of broken up a bit and then the the structure is much more complicated Mm -hmm. and you get an intermingling of the positive and negative energies. And then you, you get the potential for, um, CMEs, which of course dump masses of charged particles. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and are actually responsible for the, um, solar wind as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and these are things that we can't see with the naked eye, but they they can be measured quite easily with the right equipment. And we, we we actually can see them with the naked eye once they hit um, our poles, and we get the aurora borealis and the aurora mm-hmm. australis. Yeah, um, I mean, just to continue his theories, he also attributed great importance to magnetic fields and saw them as integral to the structure mm-hmm. and behavior of celestial bodies and space itself. Um, dual polarity. He exp- he emphasized the concept of dual polarity in the universe with positive and negative electrical charges playing a crucial role in all phenomena, which I I find that really compelling because mm-hmm. apart from electricity itself and electromagnet- electromagnetism with positive and negative, it also represents more than that because if you think of the, the yin and yang, you have the dark and the light or the positive and the negative or the, um, the good and the bad, the the good and the evil etc everything seems to have its opposite in the universe Mm -hmm. um so dual polarity is quite compelling but then there's quite a quite a few things aspects of russell's theories that are fairly compelling um he also suggested the stars were not powered by nuclear fusion but by electrical processes just goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago Mm -hmm. and he viewed them as focal points of electrical and magnetic activity um, his model also proposed an interconnected universe where all bodies were linked through electrical and magnetic fields. And we're actually discovering that that's, that that's true. There's an electrical connection between the sun and the planets. There's an electrical connection between the center of the galaxy and all of the planets and everything mm-hmm. else in the galaxy through the current sheath. Um, where it gets controversial is he dismissed, he didn't entirely dismiss gravity, <clears throat> um, but Russell's model significantly downplays its role, yeah. um, and he um, he attributes many gravitational effects to electrical phenomena instead. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, all of this conflicts with well-established physical laws and observations, but I this, this show is obviously about exploring. Yeah, but the we unknown. Always, <clears throat> see that this is the thing about science because. You never prove anything right in science. You only ever prove things wrong. 
Mm. And what you do is you put up a theory and then people take pot shots at it until it's either standing there still, right? Not proven as a as 100% right, but nobody's been able to take it apart. Or gradually, piece by piece, people take it apart and you have to come up with a different theory. And, and that's what science is about. And people don't seem to understand that the science well, is never, never settled. Well, that's the thing. And I, I mean, it, science is very institutionalized now as well. Mm. It, it's we don't we don't have these polymaths that are kind of in a in a laboratory just studying this, that and the other. And, and making interesting discoveries. And I mean, the, the connections between um, Russell and Tesla, because they corresponded. Um, let's just go through, I've got a list of them. Um, they met in 1894 when Russell was in his early 20s um, and reportedly maintained correspondence for many years after the initial meeting. Tesla is said to have been impressed by Russell's ideas. According to some accounts, Tesla told Russell that his work should be given to the world. Both men had unconventional ideas about the nature of the universe, energy, and matter, which likely formed the basis for their intellectual connection. In 1930, when Russell published the, the Russell Genera Radiative Concept, Tesla reportedly advised Russell to hide his work for a thousand years, mm -hmm. believing that the world was not ready for it. Which it probably wasn't. I mean, it wasn't. I don't think it was ready for most of Tesla's work either. Yeah, it probably um, wasn't. It still isn't, to be fair. No, it's and and the stuff that's just goes back to all the conversations that we've had about what's being hidden. Um, now, while Tesla and Russell's association is often me mentioned in discussions of Russell's work, detailed records of their interactions are limited, and some claims about their relationship may be exaggerated or difficult to verify. Um, despite their connection, Tesla and Russell had very different career paths and levels of scientific recognition. Tesla was a re renowned inventor and electrical engineer, while Russell's work remained largely outside mainstream scientific acceptance. Now, the other thing that's worth noting is that the great scientific discoveries have almost never come from the mainstream. It's mm -hmm. always the, the outliers, the people who are initially ridiculed, and um, kind of cast out from the mainstream, whose theories sometimes don't don't actually oh, come back until long after they've died. Yeah, look at Copernicus, Galileo, mm. you know, um, Leonardo da Vinci. You know, all these people were castigated as in their own time, weren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, should we put a video on? Let's start with that fourth one. Yeah, the fourth one. Because um, he was also a sculptor. How much of this are we playing? Um, you can turn, just mute it. Right. Um, actually, no, this this particular one, yeah, you can mute this one. Um, right, okay. Because he just, just wanted to show people some of his sculptures. Because he was a self-taught sculptor. That's a um, bit of a Salvador Dali thing there. He, he yeah, and, that, did he? and a painter. And absolutely fascinating chap completely and he's the thing is he's exactly the sort of person that would be ignored by the mainstream simply yeah. because that's what the mainstream does okay pause that one um yeah let's watch the first one and i, I wouldn't do wouldn't do too much of it because this first one we need to sound up we can always do it in bits mm -hmm. to not get nailed in the face by youtube Um, but I don't, I don't know. Are there are there still polymaths out there who? I don't know. This is kind of music. Is that not working? No, it's work. Uh, oh, sorry, that was my fault. I, f I forgot to <laughs> share this tab instead. Right, how's that? <laughs> so um, I've muted it just now because it's just music. When does oh. the sound start? Uh, th this one I didn't have it on a time, time uh, stamp. This, right, okay. but it's only like two minutes, so yeah. I think, I'm not sure how much video we can uh, we can play, but it, it's it's essentially well, it just says, explaining. It says we can clap it, so normally we're all right to take some of it. 
Um, I mean, but this has fair use because what we are doing is we are looking at a video uh, and we're commenting it. So, I mean, this is some of the stuff. Wave pistons of light are off the ocean, operate radially and spirally inward and outward towards and away from gravity. Now, that whole statement sounds like a nonsense, right? But when you start to look at it and then understand how waves work, you know, electromagnetic waves, then I think... In some respects, I think he and Einstein were trying to describe the same thing, except in just different, a, 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 with a different form of words and a, diff, a slightly different concept. I think Einstein was trying to show how gravity comes about, but wasn't particularly successful, in my view, in telling you what causes gravity. No. Because there and isn't a graviton, there isn't a gravity particle. I think that's a load of nonsense. And Listen, I mean, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite specific on this. I think photons are a load of nonsense as well, because I don't think, I don't think light's an emission. I think it's a petter, a perturbation of the media, right? So at least we don't like, have to worry about photon torpedoes. Well, yeah, but you, you, <laughs> you, know, you remember Tesla? Tesla said, you know, light is to the eye what sound is to the ear, right? Mm. And and when you turn your speaker on. Right. When you turn your radio on or your your gramophone <laughs> and put a record on and the sound blasts out the speakers, sound doesn't blast out the speakers. What does the speaker do? The speaker vibrates, right? And what that vibration does is perturb the medium. In this case, the medium is air. And the, the vibration then proceeds to enter your eardrum and vibrate the drum, which is then through all the little bones, these tiny little bones, transmitted through to the canale and you hear it as it moves the the liquid in your canale and and makes the uh, the little hairs move up and down and that's what how you receive your audio so if this if you apply the same thing to light then the light waves perturb the medium and the medium in this case has to be has to be the ether mm. Yeah, but the ether is one of those concepts in hold science. On, hold on, hold on. No. Photons weren't shot down cathode ray tubes in old televisions. Electrons were shot down cathode ray tubes. Not photons, electrons. So that's a, I've got to pull Spencer up for that. Right, anyway, sorry, carry on. No, no, it's fine. Keep uh, Let's keep the, the video Ah, right, playing. okay. Yeah, that just seems to be music. Yeah, no, we don't, don't need the music. I, I thought that there was uh, there was sound on this one. But it's the other one. Um, anyway, let's let's keep. Oh, hang on, no, there we go. So waves. Just pause it. Waves. Waves of light do not travel. They reproduce each other from wave field to wave field of space. The planes of zero curvature, which bound all wave fields, act as mirrors to reflect light from one field to another. This sets up an appearance of light as traveling, which is pure illusion. Now, <laughs> what do you make of that? There's a lot to unpack in there. Well, I mean, it can well, waves, con- waves, waves don't travel anyway, because when you think about it, when you look at the water and you drop a, when you drop a, a pebble into the middle of a pond, right, and the wave permeates across the surface the water doesn't move it only goes up and down yeah well it's only when a wave if, if you're thinking about the ocean it's only when the the water the water's only going up and down right yeah but it's and when, when it that... gets when it gets to the shallow bit what happens is it goes up higher mm. than the than the there's no water in the other bit to sustain it so that's when it starts to fall over um, but then what about tsunami well, a tsunami is the same. It's it's the same, although what you have is a standing. It's basically a standing waves, but it's just the water's jumped down or up, right? And right, and the yeah. water is then traveling at five hundred kilometers an hour or whatever it is because it's incredibly fast, mm. and it's only like an inch high because the water's just dropped. You know, so there's an undersea earthquake. Water's dropped. Boom, wave. You see the wave, but the water itself isn't moving. It's only when it gets to the shallow bit, because the water has dropped, it piles up so high, and then it comes onto the land. Mm. 
But does that does that apply to other things apart from water? And waves. Well, I think it applies to all waves. Mm. See, I think what you're doing is perturbing the media. You know, in, in the case of sound, you're perturbing the air. So the air doesn't travel as such. It just boom, 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 boom. You know, it resonates. Mm -hmm. That's my view. Yeah, well, I mean, no, people, people will disagree with me, you know. I mean, and, and feel, feel perfectly free to do so because, you know, I'm a disagreeable person. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I, I just can't see it. I'd, and I think when you when pe and people start going on about things like um, quantum wave functions and the quantum wave duality, and, you know, I'm a bit with Einstein on this, and I don't think, you know, nature plays plays fast and loose with the universe. I don't think you can have two things at once, you know? No, I think that our understanding is of how things work is a lot more limited than we think it is. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there are certain, certain things that just can't happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and it's like, I mean, the, the one that gets me when you come to light is... When light goes through a glass of water, right? So we've got a glass of water and we look through it and the light, you know, when you look through it, you actually see the thing that's on the other side is in a different position than where it actually is, you know? Mm. Yeah, my fingers aren't there. You know, you can't see them above the lemon. If I move them above the lemon and then slide the glass, look, the fingers are in a different position. You see that? Well, it's right? the same with when you wear so, glasses. Yeah, but that's fine because, I mean, you know the reason for that? Because as the light goes into the glass, it's the medium slows it down in effect, mm -hmm. which bends it, right? Yeah. And then as it comes back out, heals the bit, speeds it back up. Which is kind of crazy when you think no, about it. It's not crazy, mate. It fucking breaks the laws of physics. <laughs> because yeah, but... that's, that's like... Where's the energy coming from for the light to increase speed if it's a particle? But surely if something breaks the laws of physics, the laws of physics don't adequately explain that phenomena or are plain wrong. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. I don't think photons exist. I really don't. Anyway, what are you drinking tonight? I am on the... This is... I'm not sure if Rich is listening watching it's castillo montanez tempranillo mm -hmm. so it's a nice bit of spanish and it's had a good amount of time to breathe so it's rather delicious I'm how about you, are you, you fire tonight are you still teetotaling no 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 look jack daniels uh, fire. Fi fire water what's that one taste like i don't think i've seen that one before it's got a kind of hint of spices and cinnamon it's quite oh, okay. nice yeah. Oh dear. Sounds a bit. I think the um the Tennessee honey one is quite nice, but it can get a bit sickly. This one's more of a punch to it. Yeah, a bit of cinnamon would do that. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I'm not normally a fan of Jack Daniels. So it's, oh, uh, it's completely different from a regular J D. Mm -hmm. The oh, worst perfect. one is it's in a in a bar asking for a bourbon and being given Jack Daniels. Uh, Jack this Daniels is isn't a bourbon. It's, it's, Tennessee, it's Tennessee sour mash whiskey. Yeah. Which is very, very, very different. Right. Walter Russell. <coughs> uh, did we go through? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. So. So we're about uh, 50 seconds into that video. Do you want to keep going? Yeah. Let's keep going. Probably dun, just dun, skip dun, it. Dun, 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 dun. That's the next bit. Just skip a little bit further forward. Pass and that text changes. There you go. Mm. So the sunlight we feel upon our bodies is not actual light from the sun. Let's pause it, please. What's actually happening is that the sun is reproducing its own condition on the earth by extending the reproductions out through cold space in ever enlarging wave fields until those reproductions begin to converge again towards our center of gravity into even smaller wave fields. Right, so that just broke my brain a little bit. Yeah, so okay. The sun is reproducing its own conditions on the Earth 
by extending the reproductions out. What is a reproduction? I missed that bit. I don't know. Um, it, didn't, it didn't explain reproductions. Through cult, it's well, it's reproducing its own condition. So the See, reproductions. Here's, right, right. So here's a couple of things about cold space that we talk about, right? Because they tell us that when you're on the moon, the temperature can be as high as like 270 degrees centigrade. And then as low as minus 200 and, you know, 50 degrees centigrade mm -hmm. when the sun's not in view, right? But how, how do you dissipate the heat from the space suit that you're generating if the temperature outside is 270, or let's just say 200 degrees centigrade. Well, I think the thing with those spacesuits is that, well, uh, this is this is on the big fat assumption that people have actually been to the moon. Let's yeah. just caveat that one. Um, and for our show about that, see our playlist. Um, but, I mean, I think that the idea with the spacesuits is, apart from anything else, they're, they're white and reflect a large amount of the of the heat away from them. Yeah, okay, f that's fine. But you're generating heat as a human. Okay? And if you can't dissipate yeah. that heat, it's going to keep building up, building up. And some of these guys were out there apparently for, what, 12 hours mm. on a spacewalk in the sun, right? How do you dissipate the heat when the outside temperature is, is supposed to be vastly higher than the temperature inside your ship? Um, that's a bloody good question. I it's like not that. like you can put a radiator out there, you know, because the, it won't work, will it? Well, because it's in a vacuum, so no. Yeah, it's in a vacuum. Yeah, exactly. Allegedly. Well, it's a very good question. <laughs> it also, I mean, if you actually look at the um, the the landing craft that they they supposedly went down to the moon in. Um, mm -hmm. That was all pretty thin, aluminium looking thing. It didn't it didn't seem like it had a huge amount of insulation and No, it had the gold tinfoil on it, didn't it? Mm, yeah. <laughs> gold, gold tinfoil, that's your saviour. Right well, I mean they cover they cover the, 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 the internet. I mean and the, the International Space Station can actually be seen through a telescope. Yeah. So yeah. I'm 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 pretty sure I'm not necessarily sure that all of NASA's videos are shot on the International Space Station. Uh -huh. I'm not. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that all the people that they say they're up there are up there. Uh, that this is also debatable. I think there is something up there, though. I, I think there is an actual well, orbiting it, I, I space mean, it, station. It's been seen by multiple people in multiple parts of yeah. the planet. I mean, I've seen it. I've seen it go across. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean, it always. If you look, if you get a uh, telescope on it. Mm -hmm. You can make out the structure of it, so there's clearly yeah. something up there. Yeah, there's something up there, and you and you can um you you can tell when it's coming as well because mm -hmm. it's charted. So there are websites that show you when it's going to appear. Yeah, and it does. It appears on cue, you know, and you can watch it fly across at seventeen and a half thousand miles an hour or whatever mm -hmm. it's doing. So it does cover the sky quite quickly. But that's not to say that NASA aren't screwing with us. That's Let's just make that very clear, because That's, I do absolutely yeah. believe that NASA. I mean, there's so many videos of supposedly weightless astronauts, and you can see a glass of water on the counter next to them. Or oh, the guy playing and, ping pong. Did you see yeah, that? and and other glitches. So, like when a guy dropped a screw. Yeah. And it went bang. <laughs> <laughs> and you went, ah, huh? why the screw fall? And he didn't. Yeah. Um, right. So back to this. Back to this. Um, this mind bender that you've given us here. Mm. So the sun is reproducing its own condition on the earth by extending the reproduction out through cold space into ever landing wave fields until those reproductions begin to converge again to work for a certain of gravity. So what's he is he saying that like by the inverse square law or whatever, as it goes out, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker, right? But as yeah. it gets towards as it gets towards the the, the planets, they're they're why why would you see why wouldn't it be gravity? Why wouldn't it be electromagnetic? Why wouldn't it be our why wouldn't it be our attraction or electromagnetic attraction? Because the planet's well charged, doesn't it? Mm. So 
So again, I mean, I mean, okay, we're making stuff up here as on the fly, <laughs> but isn't everybody? So why wouldn't it be the electromagnetic uh, attraction that would then like focus it back down towards us? So effectively saying that it's focusing the, but it's not focusing then and the traveling. So it's just a perturbation of the media then, which has got to be the ether. Yeah. Well. No? Yeah, I mean it, it's. I I don't know. I I. <laughs> I've been ra- trying to wrap my head around these these theories. Right. Okay, so the so, heat we feel, and the light we see, are dependent entirely, upon the ability of the wave fields to reproduce the light and heat, and that ability is conditioned upon the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. I. Okay, <laughs> I can I can understand why mainstream science has an issue with this guy. So is he but, saying that? Is he saying that effectively we're a microwave, and if we are got more water around here, you get more excitement in the water, and it's going to produce more heat? Well, that's what that's how it seems to me. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. I'm not sure Maybe. if that's if 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 there's any if it's accurate at all. Yeah. Um, but let's let's keep going with the video. Whoa! So if there were no moisture in the atmosphere, our bodies would carbonize from the heat, thus reproduced. One cannot consistently think of that heat as direct rays of the sun, but that same sunlight was intensely cold during its reproduced journey through the immensely expanded wave fields of the space between the uh, sun and the earth. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Right, so if we um, well, if we think about if we think about Death Valley in California, mm. because I've been there, right? Yeah. So I have some personal experience of what it's like. So if we think about Death Valley in California, it's lower than sea level, right? Um, it's in a desert. Because California does have, I mean, I think North America is one of the few countries in the northern hemisphere that has deserts. Um, mm. Mongolia, maybe being the other, one of the others. Well, the Mongolian deserts in all. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so we have we have the we have Death Valley, right? Mm. And now, if you think about it, on the same latitude, you've got LA, right? More or less. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Which um, which is considerably milder in climate. Now it's the same sun that's hitting these places. Yeah, yeah. So if LA is sitting at thirty degrees centigrade and Death Valley sitting at fifty five, right? Yeah. It's the same sun. Mm-hmm. The difference is there's a lot less moisture in Death Valley than there is in um. California, California, because you're California. Uh, sorry, when you get to California on the coast, you've got a maritime climate like we have here, so there's a lot more moisture. But surely there's a different amount of moisture in the upper atmosphere. Maybe that well, yeah, makes a difference. Yeah. yeah, but that's more uniform. Surely the moisture in the upper atmosphere. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so the. The, at the surface, there's a lot less moisture in Death Valley, and when you step out of the car, it's like walking into an oven. Mm. And, and that's what it feels like. I mean, you know when you open the oven door and um, you know that, that blast of heat hits you in the face and you think, I've just lost my eyebrows. Yeah, yeah. you should you, you just yeah try a, arriving in uh, Egypt in the summer. Yeah. Well, yeah <laughs> the plane, exactly. plane door opens and, yeah. yeah. Right, so, let's, let's, should we keep going with this one yeah because, okay uh, let's see what's the next what's next what's next okay right the light and heat, heat that appear to come from the star or sun have never left the star or sun okay yeah, yeah. so what's right. happened instead then 
that which man sees as light and feels as heat are the reproduced counterparts of the light and heat which are its cause. And he painted that as well. Okay. Is so, that... so it's a perturbation in the media. That's effectively what he's saying. Yeah, yeah. but the, the, but how does that work? Because well, the, it's like right. The, so the, the, <clears> he, let, 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 let's think about something we know, right? And we mm. know we know about sound, and we have access to it, and we know how it works, right? Yeah. So. We're playing music in our in our gramophone or record or whatever, and the needle's going up and down, and it's making a vibration, and it's making the speaker go like this, which is pulsing the air, right? Mm -hmm. Which is there's no sound, there's no sound particles coming out the speaker. There's nothing actually coming out the speaker at all. All we've got is the speaker cone moving, and perturbing the atmosphere around it, right? Yeah. So. There's no particle of sound that transmits anything. So nothing actually leaves the speaker. I see what you're saying. And, and, yeah. and with the sun, there's no actual particle of heat that's yeah. leaving the sun. It's perturbing the, the, media. the media. Which has got to be the ether, you know. Because that's yeah. all we have, you know. Or well, that's all we can think of at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Well, it's as good an explanation as any. A photon doesn't exist, soldier. <laughs> that's um, that's just my view. I think uh, photons don't exist. You can't have a massless particle that travels at the speed of light. You just can't have it. Nope. Well, <clears throat> it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense for a particle to have no mass. It's not a particle then, is it? Well, No. Yeah, exactly. It's got to be something else. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a. You, you might as well call the thing that comes out of your speaker a soundion. <laughs> soundion. <laughs> I, I've, soundions are coming out my loudspeakers and perturbing the media, and then they're the the soundions. No, they're not. They're traveling through the media and hitting my ear, and that's how I receive sound waves. No, no, that's not how you receive them, mate. No, you don't need a photon. You don't need a photon to see light. And and the thing is, if photons existed, right, wouldn't you have to empty your camera when you filled it up? That's a that's a actually a really profound point. Yeah. See when you turn the light off, wouldn't you have to sweep all the photons out and then shut the door to make it dark? Or you'd have a build up of photons in your eyeballs. Well yeah, how would you get them out? And the other thing about sound is that when, when you think about this situation that we're in at the moment, when I'm talking, the vibrations that are being produced by my vocal cords and my mouth are being picked up by the, the microphone, mm -hmm. converted into a digital signal, mm -hmm. pumped into the computer, onto the internet, into your into your thing and you're broadcasting that out to YouTube so the people who are listening it, to it that's yeah it's waves not part not particles or yeah, photons it's waves or, it's waves so there's no there's no emission nothing's nothing's radiating as such soldier you don't have an emission there's no emission there's no emission of light light's not an emission it's a perturbation in the media, and the thing is, the media's got can't be air because the media goes through things that would stop air, like glass. You mm. know, right? So it can't be air. That media has to be the ether. In my view, frequency, well, not particles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's keep going with the video because we're nearly yeah. we're nearly, nearly there. The end. I think that's another one of his paintings. In the wave lies the secret of creation. Which is really cryptic. <laughs> yeah. Polymath paints that was a sculptor. I, I author, think that's the end of it. Student of science and physics. Uh, we can Indeed put those other ones on that I sent you as well, if you like. Yeah. That might elucidate things a bit more. Uh, audio for this, yeah? Yeah. God's universe of light. It is also the law. 
Russell believed that all matter is created by dividing gravity into pairs and created a mesmerizing chart that unveiled the intricate dance of every element along a nine octave cycle. Okay, let's just to illustrate. So, can you just just skip it back a couple mm -hmm. of frames to that last? Uh, That's the, well, the, yeah, the one before that, and then we can come back to this one. Uh, yeah, no, I think that yeah, was... No, the one before that is the blue sky. Yeah, no, no, I think it's it's that one. So, I, <laughs> I'm, strugg I'm struggling <laughs> with this. So, the secret of creation lies in the wave. But, I, yeah, I don't get it. It's... It's not what do you make of that one what's the next image because there was another another screen well, that came up after this one I, actually let's just have a quick dig at johnny and john because he had a dig at me earlier so ener energy doesn't necessarily leave the speaker right he says what leaves the speaker is energy and why would energy leave the speaker because the energy is expended in moving the cone so the mm. energy isn't leaving the speaker at all it's still within it it's just been dissipated by moving the cone. And that energy will be translated into heat. It's like a wave machine. It's very yeah, cool. exactly. Yeah. Right, anyway, carry on. Yeah, no, let's just, just play it again. And then okay. or skip it forward to the next visual. That came the next up. visual was that. High pressure short waves, low pressure long waves. Which so this doesn't... is... It's, this is this is stuff I think that you need some kind of psychedelic substances to help you with. Yeah. You know? Um I see that one at the bottom. That's just that's a bar magnet has four pairs of poles, not one pair. Mm, how does it? How does it have four <laughs> pairs of poles? How I mean that's 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 so heavy, I, man. Because I thought a magnet was just one pair of poles, positive and negative. A dipole, yeah. But is there other different? Well, is it's there a different type see, of magnet. Well, no, no. But if you would you see the the elusive search for the monopole magnet, you know, it doesn't exist. Well, so the thing is, if you take a bar magnet and cut it in half, you end up with two bar magnets. Yeah. You don't end up with a south pole and a north pole, right? So that that's fine from that point of view. So no matter how much you divide your bar magnets, you're going to end up with two poles. But <laughs> where where does a bar magnet has four pairs of poles? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. Let's keep going with the video. Yeah, that's heavy. Hypotheses. Russell relied on illustrations that are as visually striking as they are mysterious. Born to Nova's... No, hold on, let's go back and look at that last one. Because that's the, um, that's what the Fibonacci se sequence, isn't it? Oh. The spiral. It's hard to get these. To illustrate his hypotheses, Russell relied on illustrations that are as... All things are involved in all things. Mm, that's profound. <laughs> <laughs> uh, light and sound are one. Well, that see, that's not what Tesla said, right? And, and I, I think I got to disagree there. I don't think light and sound are one. I think because they're perturbing different media. Mm. Gravity multiplies what? Gravity multiplies. I can't quite read it. What oh, if you make it full God. screen? Yeah, I can't. If I make it full screen, it'll go. go can't zoom time. in. Uh, it's leaving that. Hold on. Let's try it. Right. No, no, it's not. It won't go full screen because it's being shared. So, gravity multiplies. Divides and balances light and sound. Okay, uh -huh. so he's saying that light, 
light and sound are the same thing that gravity turns light into light and sound into sound? Opening and closing spirals constitute the heat, the heartbeat mm -hmm. of the universe. Well, the, the thing with the spirals, I do find compelling because that is a shape that exists. The golden everywhere. ratio. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the galaxy. It's You see it. You see yeah. it in small um, fossilized, what are they called? Shell thingies. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it's water. It's water going down a plug hole. It's it's a tunnel. It's the Earth and the planets going around the sun. Um, it it's a recurring shape in our universe, which is yeah. which is something that I, which is one of the reasons that I find Russell's theories worth actually trying to understand a little bit because I don't know. There's there there are things that don't seem to make sense but what here we go oh. <laughs> is this is you sure this isn't walter bishop <laughs> <laughs> oh, it looks a bit like it could be yeah um conventional life he had his first illumination experience at the age of seven in 1878 it will be his first out-of-body experience. In 1885, at 14 years old, he was reportedly pronounced dead after an attack of black diphtheria, but claimed he was asked to return during another out-of-body experience. He claimed at some point to have been struck by lightning. The year 1921 would be life-changing for Walter. He started his self-study and was the first to... Oh, Jesus. Oh, right, all right. Okay. So, um, God is light, God is mind. Yeah, well, no, I know where he's coming from here because what he's saying is God doesn't, um, God doesn't in a separate unit. You know how, you know how when we think about, um, we think about God, we tend to think about the spirit realm being a different universe in effect, you know? Yeah, it's spirit, like people sitting uh, on a cloud. Yeah, well, it's or a spiritual. In fires of hell. A spiritual realm and a, a you know the materialistic realm that we inhabit just now but his view wasn't that's not the case that's not what god is god is the universe right so he's not a separate he's not in a separate universe he didn't create you and i as part of a separate universe as some sort of grand experiment we are we are what we are because we are God. Which ties into what a lot of mystical traditions and yeah. Buddhism and all sorts of other non-Christian theories. Although there's there's certain strain within Christianity that does that as well, uh -huh. just not, not the Catholic Church. If you go back to some of the early... Um, pre-Catholic Church Christian writings, a lot of the stuff that gospels that were left out of the Bible and things well, like was, that. Actually, yeah, I mean, was... ancient Christianity is a mess. I mean, I'm not yeah. surprised that the um, that they had the Council of Nicaea in uh, 346 AD and they sat them all down and said, right, let's sort all this out then. <laughs> and they effectively <laughs> created Catholicism. But, I mean, some of the some of the old christian sects were <laughs> not not particularly christian at all <laughs> oh god i think we're losing our audience um johnny and john <laughs> i was only kidding mate you can have a go at me as much as you like honestly it's not a problem <laughs> um he did have a little dig at me earlier it was quite ah uh, it's just john just ignore him yeah no no he said that he said that he thought um, while a black t-shirt is always good, um, really, for Glasgow, a Hawaiian shirt would have been better in the summer. Um, yeah, it, it may well have been, but... You're talking... You know what? John, John, you're not, it's not someone to comment on other people's sartorial um, <laughs> tastes, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, I'm thinking about orange trainers and stuff, so oh, just nice. don't go there. Right, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, this is, this is mind-blowing stuff, isn't it? It's my mind is properly blown. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hadn't, I hadn't really, 
I'd done a little bit of research on it, and I was I was honest with you before we started. I did mm. say you were taking the lead on this well, because I, I mean, to be honest, I didn't do a, a massive amount because there's so much there. I mean, I feel like mm. I'm just sort of sitting on top of the iceberg with a with a teaspoon, kind of scratching little bits of ice away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and let's just go through some of these. So, God's universe of space is an intensely luminous, blinding white light which no eyes can see. Illuminates alone can see that light through the centers of consciousness located in their pineal glands. Okay. Right. Yeah. And he goes, God's white mind light is dark to man until he divides it into spectrum pairs of red and blue lights to screen the white light of God's mind, which centers every creating thing. I don't know what that means. Me neither. <laughs> I, I, I can understand why mainstream science is a bit perturbed by them. It's a bit like, yeah, sorry. You, you no, know, I was just going to say it's almost like you have to. But what you were saying earlier, you you need to have consumed some psychedelics for any of it to make sense. Yeah, man's senses are two-way waves of limited frequencies that do not respond to vibrations below or above a very limited range. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I mean, we've that's something that we've talked about yeah. on the show quite a lot. Yeah. Man can extend his range of sense vision by telescope or microscope, but his senses cannot go beyond spectrum effect and to mind cause. I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> what is mind cause? I don't know. This is like, you could write a Doctor Who script out of this and it would sound really compelling and it would be, you know, complete nonsense. Mm. Uh, they probably have. Wow, yeah, okay. Yeah, I... I... Should we keep going with the video itself? Yeah, because okay. Because it might Let's be see. a little bit more illuminating. Let's see where Life took an unexpected turn with another out-of-body experience he termed Cosmic illumination, well, this is during which illumination. he received new knowledge in the light. This great intellectual and spiritual encounter provided him with profound insights into the nature of matter, light, and the mechanics of the universe. Immersed in this amazing cosmic state for 39 days, Russell utilized the opportunity to document and... Let's pause it. Um, so he was, what, tripping his balls off for 39 days? Or some some sort of I mean it doesn't it doesn't say what caused this altered state of consciousness. Um, but yeah. being in that sort of state for thirty nine days, yeah, I I mean I guess stranger things have happened. It's it it's hard going. Uh, it's hard going. Um... <laughs> Just a little. Just wait. At, at, at least he doesn't. Me he hasn't mentioned non-Euclidean geometry. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's give him give him time. It may it may well happen. <laughs> I'm I'm kind of at the at the. Oh God, John, stop! <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Uh, right. I don't do football, so the joke's lost on me. No, I don't do football either. I mean, <laughs> he sends me bloody scores. It's like England are playing Holland. I don't care. England have just scored. I don't care. Holland have just scored. I really don't care. I'll tell you what, though. <laughs> if I, I cared, a, I'd be watching it. I found a video today of England fans serenading a German cop. <laughs> I saw that too. The, the policeman looks like Gareth Southgate. <laughs> He's a dead ringer for Gareth Southgate. Yeah. A oh, dead no. ringer. Oh, that's hilarious. It was <laughs> hilarious. And, and the, what was even funnier was his mate, i.e. German cop number two, was behind them filming them and <laughs> yeah. laughing his guts out. <laughs> Ah, uh, hilarious. Well, at least at least they didn't do what I've seen other German police do and batter the crap out of them. No, they seem to be uh, taking it in good uh, good spirits. Unlike when the... <laughs> well, <laughs> let's leave the rest here. Let's leave the rest here. Right. 
<laughs> illustrate everything he discovered, intending to share his newly discovered knowledge with the world. Through his newfound insight, Russell unveiled a remarkable discovery. All matter originates from a zero-point field of energy, the genuine essence of the universe. He revealed that we are all electric creatures floating in an electric sea of this electric universe. The electric... Well, that, that, I mean, we know that. that. That's... To anyone with half a brain, that's patently obvious, that part. Mm-hmm. Um, although I th I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to think that Tesla might have had a point. He was either just putting them off or he genuinely meant it, you know? Put this that's away for a thousand years. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, I'm 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 kind of I'm I'm not sure our our puny little human minds are capable of actually grokking this. Um Yeah. I mean I it, it's like pa, pa, did you just use did you just use the muskrats fucking stolen AI as a as a as a verb? No, I was using it as it was used in Robert Heinlein's book, Stranger in a Strange Land. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. I thought you were. I thought you were. No, because Grok... you, were, you went straight to the source. No, okay. no, 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 no. Elon stole it first. Um, no, Grok is actually a word in in Heinlein's book, Stranger in a Strange Land. Brief, very quick synopsis is about um, oh. a. Um, this is before we knew what Mars was really like. Yeah. Yeah. I've read and. It. <sighs> It's set in the future, and they send an expedition to Mars, and th there's a problem with the expedition, and people get trapped there, and it turns out that um, two of the people are having an affair, and one of them is pregnant, and there's a kid, and the kid's been left on Mars. And they send another ex expedition back to get him, and they bring him back to Earth. And this, this child, because he's been raised by Martians, has all sorts of abilities that one might consider supernatural, or like superpowers. Yeah. But the Grok is the word that the Martians use that doesn't have a human equivalent, which is to to know something not just to not just to know about it, but to like properly understand it completely. Just like uh, it, yeah, and yeah. so Grok is basically understanding at a fundamental level. Yeah, which is completely the opposite of what Musk's AI does. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it, yeah. it's got too much attitude as well. It's just like they've taken a a basic shit. LLM and just slapped a bit of Elon's shit, weird sense shit. of humour. Yeah, it's like, I mean, Elon <laughs> was bad enough. He didn't need to make a computer version of him, really, because that's all they've done. Oh God! And yeah, you look at that, and some stupid idiot is going to connect one of these things. To a bunch of weapon systems, and then suddenly it's um, Terminator scenarios. Yeah, Sci yeah. Uh, scientists, could, right? Should we keep be. going with the video? Yeah, yeah, or... Okay. Uh, well, what well, because is... we've hit nearly an hour. I don't know if we've actually still got anyone apart from John and a and soldier watching. We've still got eight <laughs> people. We've hung on to eight viewers, which is you know, that's pretty good considering we've been. It's baking, a kind of baking heavy. Noodles. It's a heavy, um, it's a heavy subject tonight. Mm. You know, I think, I think next week we should go to Alaska. I think, yeah, no, let's do Alaska next week. We're going to do Alaska next week, and we're, you'll love it because we'll be we'll be all over the place in Alaska. We'll be doing cryptids, we'll be doing ancient gods, we'll be doing doing tulpas. We'll this do the whole. Is in fact, Alaska. we'll even do the thing that's half wolf, half orca. <laughs> Imagine meeting that in a dark night, huh? <laughs> no thanks. Yeah. <laughs> but that's so, yeah. That, that. That sounds like a lot of fun. I think tonight's was fun. I mean, it's been really good chat, but it's been super heavy. Uh, it's heavy, mate. This is one for the pub. You know. Uh, um, it's yeah. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> a, it's a. You. Uh, this is one that you probably need to do over a series. Mm. We maybe come back to this. Because it's like I, I, this I think is like a primer. It. Mm. This is like a primer for for um, Russell Walter Russell. Yeah, no, I think we yeah. should definitely revisit this one for sure.
Yeah, because there's a lot more to him than just this. Because there's a whole, there's a whole um, spiritual side side mm. of things that we haven't even looked at yet. Absolutely, and I mean, he was an like I said, he was an artist, a sculptor, absolutely fascinating character. But, but that's a good one. You know, the periodic chart there, remember that because he did do that. The American Academy of Sciences in 1941 awarded a doctorate on him after several laboratories had isolated the elements which he had foreseen. So he came up with the elements before anyone could prove they were there, and ultimately they did. Which kind of, to me, that says that this is someone that is worth listening to and trying yeah, to yeah. understand what he was talking about rather than just ridiculing it as saying, oh, no, this is, this is all unproven by mainstream. Yeah, so is bloody heliocentricity until you stop burning people at the stake for even suggesting it. Yeah, it's good to see you, soldier. I haven't seen you for a while, mate. Um, or have we? Did you turn up the other night as well? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Physics at this, I, I, I tell you. I'm not Joe Biden, but I'm getting there slowly but surely. Yeah. Um, Johnny and John says, physics at this level might be a bit heavy for a Thursday night. Much more fun to talk about 90s sci-fi, childhood confectionery, and Michael Palin's views on hats. People don't wear them enough. Well, hats, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm doing a series now on Saturdays called Saturday Night at the Movies, where I'm going to talk about movies that I may or may not have watched over the week. And um, I think I think I'm more than happy to have occasional guests on that, Ed. Um, yeah, I'd be up for that. Yeah. I, um, I, I can't can't do it every week, but... I'm, no, no, but yeah. if you're ever... It, it'll be at nine o'clock, as always. Um, but, yeah, if you're if you're game for it, just give me a shout in the, the chat, and um, we can... Uh, basically, all I do is put up an IMDb slide of the movie I watched and then talk about it. And I'm not Barry Norman by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you all this pish about oh the director was trying to convey but this. Just give well, me I'm a just heads gonna go up in advance so at least I can watch yeah. the bloody thing. Yeah, well, no, you 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 pick the movie. You watch whatever you want because all I'm doing is talking about stuff I've watched over the week, right? Right. So last last week. Last week was time travel week for some reason. I watched a lot of time travel movies like Upgrade, Predestination, uh, Primer, and I can't remember what else. But I ended up watching a lot of time travel movies last week. So this week, what have I watched this week? Oh, and Dread. I watched Judge Dread. The, not Judge Dread. I watched Dread, the mm. Carol Urban one. Yeah. Which isn't as much fun as the Stallone one. No, <laughs> But Carl, Carl Urban is, he, I don't know, he's one of the reasons I can't deal with the boys because he's just oh, irritating. He's boys. I like him in the boys. He was good on um, Reddick, you know, the, the Chronicles of Reddick. I haven't watched that. As the, the what was it they call him, the, mong, on, the under? Oh he was quite the good Mongols. in Star Trek. Under yeah, yeah, he was. Hi. What was he? Bones in Star Trek. Yeah, no, he was yeah. but I mean, his bones in Star Trek. I thought yeah. he was good in that. It's just his his faux Cockney accent in the boys that is just god awful. I just want to punch him in the face repeatedly. You what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I tell you what I did watch. I watched um I d I don't know why, but I I'd never seen it before. And the thick of it um have i seen that I'm which sure was a bbc series from about 2009 or something like that in which peter capaldi plays a dominant dominic cummings type character right it is okay. one of the best and funniest political comedies i've ever seen it's freaking hilarious and it's very very sweary <laughs> <laughs> okay peter capaldi's pretty good at it he really is but yeah, I mean, I can't do this Saturday, but I'm, I, yeah. I'll definitely join you one Saturday when I've got nothing else to do, sure. Yeah, that's cool. And as the winter maps is in, we'll probably end up doing more. Um, but yeah, so we're going to do Saturday night at the movies. Um, tomorrow night's all in, as always, um, with myself and my little chum Ben. Our little crippled pal will be on on Saturday, <laughs> eh, on Friday, sorry. Then sun, uh, sun, Sunday we'll probably do something. I've, I've been doing something every night, nine o'clock live. Um, so everything, so there's been something on every night. 
and there we go. Um, cool. And I'm going to be trying to put out more videos. And there's always the uh, the short series that's doing really well. Um, have you ever watched Burnist Burniston? No. Burniston. You probably don't get it down there. It's a Scottish. In fact, to be honest, by judging by some of the comments in the shorts, some of the people can't understand a word these guys are saying. <laughs> that would probably be me. <laughs> it's, glass, it, it, it's set. It's effectively, I think it's set in Pollock, um, which, if you know Glasgow, is not a good place. But um, I struggle with Glaswegian accents at the best of times. <laughs> It's pretty good though. It's pretty And funny. it gets worse the more drunk. So I, I got drunk with the glass witch in one night. And <laughs> I started off being able to understand maybe yeah. 75% of what he was saying. And by the end of the evening, I was just nodding my head and just, just at the appropriate moment. And he was just babbling some shite. I've got no idea, mate. Yeah, see, so you, see, so you're lucky with me because I, I don't have a strong Scottish accent, believe it or not. No, you, because no, I, as the Scottish accents go, it's go, it's not that strong. I grew up on, I grew up on the west coast, the east coast, and in Hong Kong, right? So most of the stuff on the east coast is east coast Scottish is completely different from west coast Scottish. Mm. And then in Hong Kong, I was at a service school and I was with English people all the time. So uh, I actually, when I came back to Scotland, I came, back, I came back into halfway through secondary school or something like that, and I came back to Scotland, I was sitting in the class and there was this boy kept answering questions. And I'm sitting there thinking, I have no idea what he's saying. Because <laughs> he just spoke so quickly. You know, yeah, yeah, they do. Generally, generally English. In fact, most people don't speak at the speed that which Scottish people speak when they're, especially when they're excited. Mm. And this guy was just like, Vroom. and I'm like, I have no idea what he's saying. <laughs> I've come back to a foreign country. Oh God! At least I'm not the only one. <laughs> yeah, it was weird. <laughs> It took me about a year to pick up. It took me about a year to get used to how cold it is here as well. Uh, yeah, going from Southeast Asia to Scotland, mm -hmm. that, that's a culture shock and a climate shock. Tell me about it, mate. Tell me. But, about but it. actually going back to the country that you're from and having to learn to talk again <laughs> is probably really... Uh, yeah, I can imagine that must have screwed you up a bit. <laughs> what? What I mean, I'm, I'm saying to the guy next to me, what did he say? And he'd be like, blah, 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 blah. And I'd be like, thanks. <laughs> it's like, now I'm doubly confused. Awesome. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> oh, madness. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I spent almost a year not going to school because I wasn't learning anything because I couldn't understand anyone. <laughs> I, just, I just used to, I used to, my mum and dad, my, well, my dad was away at work and my mum used to work as well. So I'd leave the house in the morning and then go back half an hour later and just read <laughs> books all day. And I probably learned more in that year than I've ever learned in my life. Because <laughs> all sense. I did was read books. Because I was yeah. supposed to be at school, so I kept a low pro. I wasn't stupid, you know. I kept a low profile, and and <laughs> I, I must have learned. I, I definitely learned more than I would have if I'd been at school. Definitely, because I breezed all my, I breezed all my, um, you know, all, all grades and hires and mm. all that. Well, it just tells you it speaks volumes about school. Oh yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Right, um, thank you very much, Ed. I think, um, it's a pleasure, really, thank you. I've had a, a lovely chat again. Me too. Um, yeah, it's always good fun. These little chats that we have do develop in some strange ways at times, but generally um, we get there in the end. Um, oh, we just decide, as, as Nicola Tesla said, let's just, let's just put it off for a thousand years. <laughs> maybe maybe come, back, come back in like 10 lifetimes or something and pick the chat up again. <laughs> <laughs> Ray in the chat says, I said, that he, he, I said before that he wants to learn a foreign language, he chooses Scottish. <laughs> yeah, but you can't just choose Scottish, Ray. You see, that's the problem. You've got to decide what part of Scotland you're going to talk. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I mean, it's bad enough in England because your accent does change every what eight miles or something ridiculous. But but Scotland's even worse because you get to the point where, like, if you go to Dundee, I can't understand the people in Dundee. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about. Ah, oh, it's not much hope for the rest of us then. <laughs> <laughs> There really is. I mean, once you get with Fife, Dundee, up that, oh, Aberdeen, oh, Aberdeen. I mean, they just, they just, their accent just goes, and then you get to Inverness, right? And it's like listening to BBC newsreaders. <laughs> it's like, it's gone, bang, the accent's gone. <laughs> Suddenly we're in, we're in 1950s BBC land. <laughs> oh, jolly good. Uh, good to see you. How are you today? I mean, it's, it's mental. <laughs> Uh, we should we should do a show on languages. <laughs> yeah, because actually languages. I mean, I speak English and Dutch. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I find languages absolutely fascinating. So, can we stick that one on the list? I think language a trial. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I did. Um, I did try and learn French when I was living out there. And, I mean, it, it didn't do too badly. We could make ourselves understood, you know. Um, but you would always get the old, you know, there's always an old woman that wants to talk to you. And in our case, it was our next door neighbor. And um, she would just start talking and not stop. And yet it's like, <laughs> all you could do is, is nod or go, hmm. You know, if you, if you weren't quite sure of what, she, well, you were never sure of what she was saying. But if you thought maybe she wasn't saying a good thing, you would kind of give it the, and she would look at you confused and you'd go, oh, yeah, we, we, we. <laughs> <laughs> And, but France is the same though, because they don't say we in Brittany and Normandy. No, they don't say we. I'm like, well, what the fuck's this? I mean, you you were learning French in what the mid Pyrenees or or southwest France. You go to Normandy and suddenly they're all going we. Well, what does we mean? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it means yes. Right. Okay. So thank you very much, Ed. Thank you, everyone thank out you. there. Like, share, subscribe, because it costs you nothing. You haven't donated, you bastards. <laughs> but remember, <laughs> no, no, be nice. But remember, you can, should you like this, you can always donate after the fact. You can go down to ko-fi.com forward slash chasing descent and drop a donation anytime you like. Pardon me. It's always, always appreciated. And of course, you can join the channel from as little as 99p a week, in which case you get early access to the stuff that's actually going up just now. So there we are. Thank you very much. Ed, say goodbye to the people. Bye-bye, people. Thank you very much for joining us. And as always, it's been great for you. Hello. Hello. Yes, we had a technical glitch there. I don't know what occurred, but uh, I seem to have lost the... I seem to lose the the um, connection. Everybody else okay? Yeah, all good. I like the new intro. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. It's cute. I, I, I prefer that style more than uh, thrash metal. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thrash metal was kind of Ben's choice, wasn't it? Yeah, it's got a really terrible taste. <laughs> it's <laughs> awful. It's <laughs> awful, mate. <laughs> I, I'm more of a kind of chilled out type of guy. I mean, I do like the odd bit of metal and stuff like that. Like, I really like Deep Purple, but thrash I metal think... has never been my style. No, and I mean, some some metal is, is superb music. Like, mm. um, even even things like ACDC, Back in Black, and mm -hmm. some of the, the Iron Maidens and Metallicas, and I, oh. I don't mind a bit of that, but it, yeah. there, is some, yeah. there is such thing as too much metal. <laughs> There is, there is. Uh, Deep Purple's Child in Time is mm. just fantastic. Uh, Ian Gillen is such a singer. But anyway, that's not where we're going tonight. Tonight we are going to Alaska. Now, did you know that Alaska is bigger than Texas? I it's also bigger than California yeah, and huge. Montana, all put together. Mm. It's ginormous. Yeah, you and... Know. You know, it has the population of Glasgow, yeah. just over seven hundred and fifty thousand people. Yeah, and I mean, it, and it's also—I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of the of shows like uh, Life Below Zero and 
uh, Alaska Last Frontier, just those those kind of mm-hmm. reality TV Alaska shows about homesteaders and and you got to admire some of them. I mean, they live literally out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and and they've built their own house, and it's, they've got an inside mm-hmm. toilet, and they've got satellite and internet and running water, and, yeah. and 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 they've they've got a plane because the other that's the other notable thing about Alaska, it has the highest number of aircraft accidents of anywhere yeah. in the world, yeah, because one of the primary modes of travel is by these um, ultralight bush planes, um, and I mean even those the guys that fly those bring your Macon. They're complaining. They can't hear you. Oh, Speak up. Project. Up. Project. <laughs> uh, we're not supposed to project when you're in a microphone. I'll just start shouting and I get complaints from the bloody neighbours. Well, yeah, but you, you're going to have to ramp your volume up slightly um, because you are much lower than me. You always are, but... Okay, give me a minute. I've turned myself down slightly, but I can't turn myself down too much. Give it Tonka, man. Give it Tonka. Make sure the Windows hasn't turned down your volume as well. It is very guilty of that. Uh, right. Anyway, did you know that Alaska also is the most western and eastern state in the United States of America? Uh, yes, I did. It's funny that, isn't it? Um. Well, there's there's a lot of things about Alaska that are fun and unusual and interesting, including the fact that it used to be owned by Russia. Russia, yeah. Well, it was Russian Aleuts that originally populated um, some of the places, especially especially that town Portlock, the one that got abandoned. But we might come to that later. Yeah, and they're still they're still there as well. Sorry, I'm still yeah. trying to find the epoxy sound. Um, so right click on your. Sound icon on your taskbar. Click on sound settings. Make sure your that's microphone's at a hundred percent. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, he's how's doing that? It. Speak to the people. Speak to the people. People, how's this? This is better. Sounds better not? to me, but I'll, I'll wait the troll room's verdict. Come on, trolls. Oh, they're not even saying anything. They're using. Oh, they will. They will. They'll get there. Bit better, says Ray. Bit better. Right. Okay, yeah, I'll so you, turn, it, turn you, it up a little bit more then. Turn it up more. Turn it all the way up, man. <laughs> Just turn it all the way up. Turn it up to 110. Turn it up to 11. Anyway, um, yeah. So Alaska is North Shirini. It's the most northern state in the continental United States. It's the most eastern state in the continental United States. And it's the most western state in the continental United States. It's the most eastern because some of the Aleutian Islands cross the 180th Meridian. In fact, some of the Aleutian Islands are much closer to Japan than they are to Alaska, <laughs> mainland. Yeah, one of the, one of the uh, the more interesting ones is a place called Dutch Harbour. Yeah, which is where all, catch. Yeah, and and I mean that's that's where all of the fishing boats and uh, the crab boats and mm-hmm. those mad crazy people that um, think that fishing in the Barents Sea is a good idea. Well, uh, it, it brings like, in big money though. Yeah, well, I just set your kitchen up in an open volcano. <laughs> I do like him. Um, I used to like Deadliest Catch. I used to watch it, um, but then, then um, I kind of got away with it. So where are we going to go tonight? Where do, where do we start? Because, you know, I've focused more on the Inuit legends and um, some of the weird things that have happened in certain towns in Alaska. Mm-hmm. But I haven't really, I haven't really gone into you know the Alaska Triangle. In fact, the Alaska Triangle might even be another episode on its own. I think the Alaska Triangle. I mean, I. I didn't cover it in detail. I I did um, essentially looking at what aspects of Alaska fit rabbit hole sort mm-hmm. of thing. Um, and there are a few things. Some of them are fairly easy to explain with conventional um, explanations. Um, others, much more complicated. Um, there's also... Um, various animals alaska's got its own version of the loch ness monster legend mm-hmm. it's also got its own version of the the kind of bigfoot sort of legend 
Um, and there's snake-like sea creatures, and there's even a dragon. Yeah, there's um, there's there's another one called the Kushtaka, which is a shape-shifting, half-human, half-otter type creature. <laughs> yeah, it's believed to lure people to their doom or turn them into fe- fellow Kushtaka. <laughs> Would you like to be lured to your doom or turned into an otter? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's not even not even an otter, a half human, half otter that can shape shift. Yeah, they've got they've got a dog man as well. They've got something that's like half wolf, half half um, mm. half human. They they they've really gone to town on the. I, I, there there are certain parts of the Inuit stuff though that's a bit disconcerting because a lot of it seems to involve having sex with your sister. <laughs> It's like it's like one of the one of the the gods or whatever or the Inuit legends is that this guy was hitting on this bird and when the lights went down, he he had his way with her against her will. But mm. when the lights came back up, he found out he was his sister. And then of course all hell breaks loose, you know, right? And they end up getting tossed into the sky as glowing embers, and she becomes the sun. And he becomes the moon, always trying to hide from her and his embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's another one where somebody becomes somebody <laughs> somebody becomes half mad, half bear, I think it is. Cats or something, right? Because some guy has a has sex with a shape shifting woman. <laughs> It turns out to have a, a it turns out to have ten kids. Half of them are human, and the other half are half, half bear, half man, half dog, it, half it, man. Something. It, it should Adley. also be po- Adley, That's it. Half man, half dog. <laughs> it should also be pointed out that cabin fever is a real thing, and and yeah. a lot of the a lot of the natives of Alaska don't get the same amount of sunlight as the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you watch well, some some of these documentaries, come the end of winter, some of them are, are literally starting to lose their minds a little bit. So, so well, but now you know how I feel because if you actually no, and I'm I'm not being I'm not being ridiculous here. I'm being serious because if you look at Scotland, it's on the same latitude as Fairbanks. Mm. You know. Yeah. So there you go. See, I told you we were quite far north. <laughs> um, but there's also, I mean, as we were talking before the show started, there's there, there have been a lot of petroglyphs discovered. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other interesting thing about Alaska is that 13, 14,000 years ago, or actually, well, but further than that, it started to flood about 14,000 years ago. At the end what, of the, the Alaska? Oh, no, the, no, no, the, the Bering Land Bridge. Because oh, right. they, but Alaska, the, Alaska was never really glaciated. Uh, now, I, I, just for the sake of anyone who's new and is watching us, if you've come here thinking that this is a structured show and we'll be going through things in, a, in an orderly manner, then sorry, I'm just sorry. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't, do, we, we don't, we don't really do it orderly. Anyway, but it was right. it Sorry. was called Beringia, right? Which oh, because Bering... because it was joined onto Russia. Yeah, right. And and, and you, you used to be able to walk from Russia to Alaska, um, and that that part of the sea, if you look at the Bering, at uh, the Bering Sea, mm-hmm. um, is actually relatively shallow compared to the ocean yeah. further south. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is it's also fascinating. I mean, that's one of the the theories about how people got to um, America from Africa, if we're assuming the conventional explanation of of human evolution, America from whatever. Africa. Yeah, they, they they basically walked it. But oh no, no, but the, 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 we we disproved the out of Africa theory a couple of months ago. I know we did. I know we did. I'm just <laughs> saying. But but I think we're pretty we're pre- I'm pretty much on board the the Mongols or the the um the kind of descendants or well not even maybe even the progenitors of the Mongols came across because if you look at you look at an Inuit person they're very very. You know, they, East, yeah. East Asian yeah. looking in appearance. Yeah, they do. They have some. Some of them do look like they could come from China or Mongolia or somewhere mm-hmm. like that. So, I mean, that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
But well, it's so so the know. so the um the Inuit have that have this um what's it called a, a legend about the ton, ton what they call the tonit tony tonit. To neat, right? Who were bigger, stronger humans than are bigger, stronger people than they were, right? And maybe slightly paler and more slightly more Western of appearance, but you know, um, they lived in in Alaska when the Inuit in a, originally moved in, and um, and everything was going okay. You know, they kind of coexisted until one of the Tonits, Tonits, Tonita, or whatever accidentally smashed up a, a, one of the Inuit's canoes and um, and this mad Eskimo guy killed the guy in revenge, I think. And the rest of the Tonito fled in fear and disappeared. So they've never been seen again. But this is a legend that seems to be steeped in accuracy. Well, what Because when, when you actually start looking into it, there are fossils and... And and artifacts and DNA that's showing you that there yeah there was a different type of human there at that time. Hmm. I mean it, it's an absolutely fascinating place because it's because of the location and the geography. There's parts of Alaska that are still completely unexplored, mm -hmm. um, and oh, yeah. almost yeah. impossible to get to. Yeah, even even if you have a plane or a helicopter or whatever, it's still because of the mountains and the wind and the weather and everything else, um, there, are, there, there are certain places that you just cannot get to very easily. Um, and it makes you wonder what, what sort of stuff is, is hiding out there, because if you're a, a Bigfoot or so it's sort of a semi-intelligent um, creature of some description, and and you have these humans encroaching on you. You're going to move further and further away from them. So mm -hmm. it does it does make you wonder what creatures may well have found shelter in those kind of undisturbed places. Um, and I mean, it's probably not. It's probably just squirrels and shit. But it does. <laughs> well, it's... I mean, they've got some pretty big animals though in the Alaska as well. Well, the thing is that I mean, Alaska does have this allure as the the kind of last sort of untouched place certainly certainly from an american perspective uh -huh. it's it, it, it's kind of the last part of america where you can you can still go out and just live off the land and get lost in the middle of nowhere yeah um, but alaska will do its best to try and murder you as well you know that story of um uh christopher mccandless i think he was called candless something it's basically a kid that oh the guy like, that went to the park no there was a oh. No, it, it was uh, there was a movie made about him. He he essentially wanted to escape civilization, so he he hitchhiked his way up to Alaska, um, and then unfortunately was found dead in a an old um, co combi van or something about six months later by a hunting party, and he they reckon that he died of poisoning. Um, oh. And he, snowfall left the what, engine running no 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 you know? it buries that he he, he had a book oh. with him about um different um alaskan <laughs> plants oh my God. um and he'd eaten a berry thinking that it was because the, the berry that he was they found growing in the area mm -hmm. was um there was a page on it for his book but if he'd read the text the wrong way around because the image, I think, was the at the end of one of the pages, and it was referring to the text that was on the next page, and he read the text on that page that was talking about a harmless berry that he could have eaten, and so I think the the, the explanation that people have come out with is that he somehow ate the wrong wrong sort of berry and ended up giving himself food poisoning. That's a pretty dodgy book, then. Isn't it? It's, I mean, it's a, it's a very sad story because um, yeah. there's all sorts of. Um, it's not in the film, but there are stories that he'd actually been abused by his dad and that he was kind of escaping from that and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's it's that allure of being able to go out and get, get lost in the bush. Um, but unfortunately, Alaska is one of those places if you don't have very, very specialist survival skills and a good amount of gear. And a gun. You want a, a gun? Well, no, he had a gun. But yeah, yeah but don't no... eat but don't eat bad berries. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Um, and and also you need a lot more than a gun. You need 
an axe, you need a yeah. saw, you need um, there's so much that you would need even just to build a shelter that was capable of dealing with an Alaskan winter. Yeah. Um, that for a kid that's, I think he, he was in his twenties or something. He didn't have, didn't have a lot of life experience. He didn't, I mean, if you're going to do something like that, you go out there and you find someone who's already doing it and, and you yeah. offer to work for them for free if they teach you what, yeah, what but they you, know. You think back to when you were 20, you thought you knew everything. Didn't you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and that's that's then you get a Darwin Award for dying in the bush. I mean, well, yeah, I, I don't understand how men make it. You know, if you make it to about 35, you're probably you're going to you're going to keep going, you know? <laughs> but uh, how do men make it past their 20s? Because th we do some really stupid things. Well, that's... But that's part of being a bloke. I mean, that's... Yeah. Well, that, uh, well that, is it, like, though? Is well, that why well, you old men want to be girls now? <laughs> uh, let's... No, that is that is some sort of weird sexual fetish. <laughs> yeah, well, I wasn't really going to want to go there. <laughs> no, me neither. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so let's talk about. I tell you what. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you about Portlock. I don't know if you know about Portlock. Mm -hmm. Port Port. Um, what's it? What, there, there's Portlock and Port. What was the one next to it? Port. Oh, good. Port Graham or something? No. Mm -hmm. Oh, good God! It doesn't matter. Portlock anyway. Right. So Portlock was a village. It was it was discovered by some. Um, English admiral guy who decided he's going to set up a town there, and they came round to the the, the peninsula um, near near Big Kodiak Island, right? And um, the the it was pretty really pretty isolated. The only way to get to it was through a through a mountain, and eventually the uh, military, you know, blew a blew a hole through the mountain so they could run a railway line to it. So either boat or boat or or um, or, or rail was the way to get there and um, through the tunnel. And so there, it was a, a fairly fairly thriving fishing community. They were doing fine until about 1905 and then they discovered they discovered um, a mine with or they, they found chromium. So they started mining that and then they found gold. So they started mining that. So there was a mine. So you had three jobs in Portlock. You had mine, you were a miner. You were a lumberman, uh, you cut down trees and helped to export them, or you did fishing. And that's basically all everybody did. And that's pretty much all anyone does in Alaska. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they ended up, um, they built a cannery and all that. But 1905 was the first when somebody, st when people started to go missing. Right? And it, it, it started... It started being people like um, hunters, right? So hunters would go out, sheep hunters would go out, Probably to find and kill a sheep in order to come back and sell it, you know, because there was only like 30, 40 people lived in this town, um, permanent residents, but there's a big summer community that came in for the cannery and all that. So people started going missing, and then, um, and, and the odd hunter disappearing is fine, you know, you, you expect it to happen, he's maybe slipped, fell, whatever, mm. you know, I mean, hunters don't tend to get taken out by their prey that often, especially if they're accomplished hunters and they've got weapons, but there's, you can make an, you can have an accident, you can fall over, you know, you can get cut out, you can make get very wet, yeah, you could get very wet and end up freezing to death, that kind of thing, so they had all that, but then body parts started appearing. And and the and the lagoon and the rivers, you know, people hunters that had gone missing had been torn apart and washed down the river, and when I say torn apart, we are saying dismembered, right? And it's like, whoa. which is, I mean, that's a, a, a wild animal would potentially kill someone, but they would eat it. I mean, bears. Well, don't, you would have thought so. Well, bears and wolves don't. Yeah, don't, well, don't there tend might, to, there might mean, be a might be an explanation for this there might actually be an explanation for this but anyway this went on for like decades okay and and ultimately 36 people went missing 36 people 36 people just disappeared went missing some of them were found most of them weren't right mm -hmm. and eventually the town basically got overcome by panic and everybody left 
because the the first people to go were the like the cannery people. They upped and went. They upped and went. And said we're not staying here. And of course, as more people left, everybody that was left got more frightened because there was less people. But nobody was snatched out of the town or anything like that. You know, it was it was always people that had gone into the woods that disappeared. Mm. Um, so eventually, eventually, the town just panicked and they all left. They just left, and the place was abandoned. Round about the what forties or something. Yeah. Although, uh, technically, there was still something like 30 people living in it in 1980. However, right, they, they, they said there was a couple of things going on in Port Lock. One, you, you can imagine stories about the, the, hairy, the hairy men, you know? Mm. And now the people, the Russian Aleuts, Al, 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 you know, the mm -hmm. people that lived there before, they said that there were hairy men lived in the woods. And if you respected them and stayed away from the woods, you'd be fine. But you don't you don't do certain things. So th there was the hairy men. Then there was the the strange woman who's supposed to appear on a, a cliff over the over the town, um, wailing in the middle of the night, wearing a long black flowing dress with a really white face. So we're talking a ghost, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so. Th and then there was a hunting party went out and found they found they were looking for someone who'd gone missing and they found a moose no they didn't find a moose what they found was a scene of where a moose they reckon had been killed because it was all trampled down and you know moose is a pretty big animal it can weigh up to 1400 kilos 1400 kilos that's They're that's as much as that's as much as a small car easily and they're they're big as well. Yeah, they are big. Six foot at the shoulder. You know, mm. that's that's a big animal. Fourteen hundred kilos, six foot at the shoulder. Anyway. So they found this area where they think a moose had been killed, but there was no moose body. And normally if an animal kills a moose, it's gonna eat it because or eat parts of it because it's too big to drag off. We've well, you know, also got a giant pair of antlers or whatever the well, hell yeah. they're called. Yeah. Yeah, they're called antlers. But, um but I mean, wolves wolves can't and... yeah, wolves can't drag off a uh, a moose that's just too big and bears pro, pro, bears probably couldn't do either and then they found footprints that looked like human footprints that were in their words 18 inches long that's a big that's a big foot that's a big mm. foot <laughs> <laughs> so anyway that's all that's all ensued in mass panic and the town just basically left and nobody's been back they don't live in it anymore um, so it's, it's abandoned and people that go there, people go there in a kind of, you know, adventure seeking and stay in it overnight and things like that. And it's meant to be haunted and, you know, you get all these attention seekers on YouTube, you know, like us. We would go there. <laughs> if we lived there, we would probably go there. I, I don't know if, if there's stories about yeah. some creature living there that, rips people that that's just like a bad horror movie waiting to happen yeah S seriously it's just like look why do you get yourself into the situation in the first place and oh look you died oh yeah. dear yeah exactly and moose, moose are not um moose are not animals to trifle with they're ill-tempered beasts at best mm. and and they will kill you i mean they they're one of the few one of the few creatures up there that can take on a bear and you know sometimes kill it actually um, but there's another creature in that area called the Kodiak bear. Biggest now, brown bear on the planet. Biggest brown bear, right? Now, there, are evi there is evidence that Kodiak bears have been interbreeding with polar bears. Right. right. Now, if you think of a liger, a lion and a tiger. Yeah. They interbreed and you end up with a, a creature that is bigger than both its parents you know what mm. I mean? if this happened and a kodiak bear some kodiak bears have footprints that are 15 inches long they're enormous right so you imagine a brown polar bear right so with all the predatory instincts and aggression yeah. that a polar bear has mm. and the size and power of a kodiak bear put That's... into a, a package that gets pissed off at men because you know polar bears don't really they, they go for people they're really curious about them and they will eat them you know because a polar bear will basically just eat anything you know? 
I mean, <laughs> what is it they say? If it's black, stand and fight. If it's brown, lie down. And if it's white, good night. <laughs> Well, that's what happens when you're a bear and you're having to survive in, in the, the yeah. world's most inhospitable environment where you're lucky if you get one or two meals a month. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's... So do, do you think that this hybrid bear yeah. creature is responsible for these? I, I think so. I think what's happened is you've either... I mean, polar bears are pretty territorial as well. But wouldn't it still eat the person? I mean... Animals are not known for wasting food. Oh, polar bears are polar bears are vicious, vicious, horrible creatures that will tear you apart literally and throw away bits of you, because they're really only, they they they'll take a seal apart and just eat the liver. You know, they they will fight orcas and sometimes beat them. Right, I didn't know. You know, that. oh, polar bears is one of the, the one of the top predators in the world. Don't mess with you only mess with a polar bear if you've got a self loading shotgun, I would say, or a high powered rifle. In fact, high powered rifles better because you can shoot it from further away because they take a lot of taking down. And you don't shoot it with buckshot, you shoot this thing with a solid slug, you know. Probably quite a large one as well. Yeah. 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 And and of course, there's all the reports about, you know, the hairy man or whatever. Um, being at fishing wheels and things, you know, that are set out to trap salmon. Oh, oh those yeah. those fish wheels are amazing because yeah. a lot of them are self built out of wood, yeah. and it's just like a water wheel, and they they yeah. put it in, and it just it just runs and it just picks fish out of the water. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that I've always wanted to try as Alaskan king salmon. Yeah, well, I mean, you might have to fight a polar bear for it. Could you think about it? If you put a f fish wheel in the in there and and it's picking salmon out of the water. A polar bear's going to go, hey, free food, you know? Well, it, I mean, it depends, because I don't think you get polar bears as far down as the Yukon, which is where a lot of the... Oh, this the, isn't the Yukon. This is right on the other side. This is right on right. the Bidon Sea, almost. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, like Kodiak yeah. Island sort of place. Yes, yeah, yeah, Kodiak Island, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, th I think probably a big bear. Probably a big bear. A big bad bear. Right. Maybe. Yeah. And... and you know, you've got to be kind of reasonable when you think about these things. You don't want to. You don't want to um, assume that everything's otherworldly or unnatural. Well, it's Occam's razor. I mean, yeah. you you don't you don't put down to alien cattle mutilations what can be explained by a bloody great big polar bear. Yeah, exactly. But. Well, how sometimes it is those, an alien you, cat, cattle mutilation. <laughs> how do you explain those perfectly circular cuts? So these are the ones I, not, I, 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 nobody seems to come out with an explanation for that because I can understand if the corpse is bloating and it splits and stuff like that, but it wouldn't tear in a perfect circuit. I mean, or like an incised circuit. And it, how do you remove a cow's rectum, you know, without... I mean, uh, uh, that's not, I'm not asking for instructions, you know. <laughs> what I'm saying is, how would you actually remove it? Sur and why? Surgically, you know, why? I mean, unless you're starting your own, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here type thing. <laughs> well, experimentation of some description. I, I don't know why you would necessarily do that to random cows. I mean, there are some... Not not necessarily mutilations, but there's mass mass deaths oh. of cows that can be explained by um, poisons and toxins and stuff in lightning strikes. Water, a lightning strike, uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't leave a hole. I mean, it would leave no, it a partially barbecued cow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Google doesn't give you the answer to these things anymore. In fact, Google doesn't give you answers to anything anymore. Does no. It? No, Google tells Google now tells you what you're supposed to think. It's like watching the BBC. You're not given information. You're given today's today's <sighs> propaganda and and the daily hate. I heard seagulls there. Yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> I had to open my windows because it's really warm. Uh, it's roasting. It's roasting meaning, here meaning as well. That, um, it's actually there's there's been a few nights where something some once it gets dark. Something, something. Is this was... a real life experience, rabbit hole? Come on. No, no, it's not a rabbit hole. It's just loads <laughs> of gulls. 
that there's sometimes something will spook the gulls. Oh, right. Really? Um, and when they fly, they all go flying overhead, squawking. But oh, because right. okay. because of Brighton's seafront, um, hotels like the Grand are lit up from the front, and that light obviously bounces off into the sky. And when you get the gulls, literally hundreds and hundreds of them all flying and squawking, and they all glow. It's very cool. I, I was um, I was thinking that you were about to tell us about something that was entering your premises of an evening, uh, but no. No, I don't think so. Anything entering my premises of an evening that's not supposed to be here gets a crossbow bolt in the forehead. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. So that's defense. Portlock. <laughs> so that's Portlock. I don't know if you'd heard about Portlock. I hadn't I... heard about it until the last couple of days when I was doing some research, and I found it quite interesting. It, it is interesting, definitely. Um, I've got one for you, which Go is on, the, the, which is the Kushtaka, also known as the Kushtaka or Land Otter People, which are fascinating creatures from the mythology of the uh, Tlingit which is like T-L-I-N-G-I-T, people of southeastern Alaska. Um, now, they are shape-shifting creatures, typically mm. appearing as half-human and half-otter. Mm -hmm. um, they can assume fully human form or otter form or any stage in between. They're often described as having long, sharp claws and teeth. Um, they're said to inhabit the coastlines, rivers, and forests of southeastern Alaska particularly associated with areas where land and water meet, which would make sense if you're half an otter. Um, they're known for their cunning and trickery, and, and they're believed to lure people away from shore, often by mimicking the cries of a baby or a person in distress. Um, they can supposedly turn humans into fellow Kushtaka by drowning them. Um, and some stories suggest they kidnap small children. Oh. Um, so, I don't know if there's... Yeah, let's, did, let's, did, let's not go down that rabbit hole. So did you know that they had a distinctive three-note whistle? Um, I didn't, actually. So apparently they have a distinctive three-note whistle, and if you should hear that, then even if it's just an otter that's lurking about, you must look at it suspiciously. Okay, that's good to know. So let's talk about, right, I'll give you one now, the adlet, right? The adlet tells you a race with the upper body of a human and the lower body of a dog. The adlet was created when an see this is this is these Inuits and their sleeping habits are just <laughs> bizarre. When an Inuit woman mated with a dog, siring five dogs and five adlet. As one version of the myth goes, the woman refused all of her suitors to marry her dog husband. In the end, both she and her dog husband perish, suggesting peril to those who choose unconventional marriage. Oh, well, uh, that, that's yeah. that's a bit not diverse enough for this program, is it? <laughs> so similar stories of half-human, half-dog races have been found in other parts of the world, including Greenland, British Columbia and Siberia. That's not other parts of the world. That's basically just extensions of Alaska. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's 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 the same the same lack of lack of sunshine and vitamin D and stuff making them all go a bit crazy and, and, and dare I say shagging it? their huskies. Dare what I say the it? these guys may have been drinking reindeer piss. <laughs> Which is known to get you high. So well, of yeah. course it does, because reindeers <laughs> love those little mushrooms that look like you know the original toadstools. That's what reindeer love. And they eat them and they're full of um psychoactive compounds and your reindeer breaks it all down nicely for you and then pisses it out without using it all up and that's why these mad finnish laplanders and you can see the you can see the influence it's had on some of the finnish politicians you know <laughs> <laughs> so, so these mad finnish laplanders go around collecting reindeer piss and drinking it do they do the same thing in estonia because it certainly seems <laughs> like it <laughs> probably <laughs> Oh dear! Well, the less the, the less said about a hallucinogenic rain, reindeer piss, the better, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> well, Johnny and John says that Benedict Cumberbatch has a a thing about otters. Now, that just sounds a bit weird because otters are too small to have a thing about. Surely, I'm more concerned about John's thing for Benedict Cumberbatch. Oh, is he? Has he got a crush on Benedict Cumberbatch? 
I don't know because this is new to me. I'm, I'm, just, <laughs> right. I'm just a tad concerned. <laughs> no, we don't have any picks. Listen, you know what? We, this is kind of like um, this is kind of like Ed and I just having a chat because, well, what's the point? I could tell. I mean, I've I've told you it's a half human, half dog. I mean, <laughs> what you want me to do? Go and pull down a and and the thing is, more and more stuff that you get online now is AI. I mean, you used to get people drawing things, but now it's like they just get lazy and go, oh, I'll, I'll make that on AI. I'll make this on AI. And it's like, would you rather watch AI or watch us? Well, you know, the, you know the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also, I mean, it is difficult to find pictures of mythical creatures that aren't just drawings from someone's imagination. I mean, maybe people, maybe people want pictures. I don't know. We do, we do have to cater to the audience, so... Yeah. So out, John. Well, yeah, it's a <laughs> it's, it's the top half of a human and the bottom half of a dog. That, that, that was quite plainly said. Anyway, um, what I, right? Speaking about Irish, right? We'll get into the Irish now, then, Shalini. So Ireland has its leprechauns. Hawaii has its menua. The Yupik have the Isenarat, a race of miniature human-like creatures with extraordinary powers. Stories suggest they live in a different dimension than ours, but can move in and out of our world easily. Despite their extraordinary powers, Arsenarat share some similarities with humans. They're often spotted hunting and gathering. For example, they always have a reputation as excellent craftsmen. You know what this sounds like to me? This sounds like the machine elves of people that have experienced DMT. Maybe. Some say the Incinera love making mischief, like leading people astray in the wilderness. Others Jeez. say the Incinera are good luck. That sounds quite leprechaunish now. Still others tell tales about kidnapping by them, in which victims are spirited away to underground lairs. Right, so... Those who journey to the realm of the Incinerate report that a day in their world is like a year in our time. What? Right. Well, that's not good. That means time passes faster here. So, yeah. so if you go and visit the Incinerate, when you come out, it's a year later. Um, but how, how... I don't I don't know how that would work. Because if they're underground, then they're part of the same... No, planet, but they're, they're probably they're probably not underground. It's they're probably just using it to to explain non Euclidean geometry. <laughs> Where did that come from? Non Euclidean geometry. Oh, I'll shut up. <laughs> Honestly, how, how is it how came is, from your kitchen? That's where it came from. <laughs> how how are they related? Okay, smart ass. Explain to me how they're related. No, they're not. They're not related at all, mate. I'm just being an arse. <laughs> You know that. <laughs> you know I'm an arse. Oh dear. So, so we are there Alaskan leprechauns that you've discovered? Yeah, yeah. Or or are they like? Would, would, have you heard that? I mean, have you had people that have go to Mount Shasta and things like that? And, mm. and well, Mount Shasta's in California, but and and we're going off topic, but we normally do, you know. So I don't think it's a big deal, um, but. I was listening to some woman who'd gone on a visit to Mount Shasta, and when she got there, she could see all these little people scurrying around the bottom of Mount Shasta, working away. And and she said to people that were there, "What are they doing?" You know, because, you know, she said they were like tiny humans, you know, all working away furiously. Right. And and she goes, "What are these people doing? What are these little people doing?" And people are looking at her, going, "You're right, love." <laughs> <laughs> So she then she thought, oh, that sounds like someone that's tripping on something. No, but then she thought, obviously I'm hallucinating, although I've not taken anything. Maybe it's just the altitude. But Mount Shasta's not that high. Mount Shasta's only like nine thousand feet or something. That's yeah. not high. I've been more than that. Yeah, but some people are more sensitive to true heights. That's true. But then she was right up the top of Mount Shasta after that. Okay. And then they were up there for two or three days or something. Then they came back down. And she, when she got near the base again, she saw them again. So that sounds that doesn't sound mm. like altitude hallucinations because she, she should be adapted to it by that point. 
Yeah, is that no. the only place that she saw them? At it's the base like... of the mountain, not at the top. No, but I meant it's Mount Shasta, the yeah. only place she saw them. Yeah. Right. I, I, that's that's unexplained. I don't yeah, know how that weird. works, especially if if there's and what are these what, what are these little people supposed to be doing? She just said they were. They seemed to be really busy. They were working away on stuff. You know, they were just doing stuff. Right. She didn't know what they were doing, but they just looked like they were doing stuff, and they were all rushing about. You know, like busy work. You know, like ants. Yeah, but not but bigger than that. You know. Maybe maybe she touched some some Ooh, there's a mildly good... poisonous plant on the way up the hill or something or down. And then the hill. touched it on the way back down again. Maybe that's a good idea. Because there's, I mean, there's certain certain I'm on plant... blush, Brett, mate. I'm on the blush. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a it's a Sauvignon Blanc blush. Uh, I saw it in the shop today, and I thought I'm going to have a go at that because it's Ed tonight, and Ed won't give me any pelters when I want to drink. Um, well, that's because I'm on the drink as well. So. Well, you know what, Ed? You know, I mean, I am trying to lose weight, and I am losing weight. I'm, I'm, I'm working at it, and I've been better. I'm only eating once a day. You know, just treat me like a dog. You know, it's possible to lose weight without sucking all the joy out of life. Though. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I haven't had a. This is the first drink I've had since last Friday, so that's not well too, done. That's good. Yeah, so that's not too bad. It is nice. It's very pleasant indeed. I, I might even buy another bottle for tomorrow night for All In with me and Ben. Join us if you dare. <laughs> oh dear. Well, you've certainly so, got a lot to talk about. Let's talk about the Qualopalalic qu or something. Qualopalalic? Qualopalic. Qualopalic. How does that sound? Snatcher of children who wander without permission. Does this not sound a bit like Wee Willie Winky? Well, it also sounds like the Kushtaka, which seem to have yeah, a exactly. penchant for stealing children as well. Because, you know what, if you're an Inuit and, you know, things are dodgy as hell, right, and and if your child wanders off, it could get snaffled by a seal or a polar bear or something, wouldn't you, wouldn't you give them frightening stories to keep them away from holes in the ice, to keep them away from wandering into the woods, you know? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the the Qualopalic is a half woman, half aquatic creature from Inuit stories who maintains a long life by stealing children who wander near the shoreline without their parents' permission. Right. <laughs> Commonly depicted as wearing a traditional Inuit arm utic, i.e. a parka, with a pouch on the back that allows a woman to carry her baby during the early years of life. When a child wanders alone towards the shore. Qualupalic is known to snatch them up and put them in the uh, uh, amutic to spither, spirit them away underwater. Children who disobey their parents are particularly susceptible to being taken <laughs> by the Qualu. I mean, this is just propaganda. This is propaganda kids to stay at home and not wander off and get eaten by a bear. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Although, why, why you couldn't just tell the kid that Look, don't go, don't go in the woods because there's bears in the woods. There's bears on the beach. Just, yeah. just don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stay near us because a bear will eat you. Yeah, yeah. I and think then, I think a bear's probably that's probably more frightening than the, a a snatcher of children who wander without permission. Yeah, but at the same time, I think parents have been telling their children scary stories to elicit correct behavior probably yeah, that of thousands of years i mean you know what, it, it's you, you know what my mom used to tell me i don't even want to know if you <laughs> if, if you three boys don't behave i'm just going to put you all in a home <laughs> <laughs> oh dear my mum used to threaten threaten to send us to zambia because we were far more, far more frightened of my dad than we were my mum <laughs> Her, her standard punishment is I'm going to tell your father and that usually just got us to do what we were told. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, also the other thing, it, I mean, it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier on about Alaska, that when you have a lot of darkness time in the winter, for yeah. example, I mean, that lends itself to telling stories because, I mean, most, most like particularly the Inuit, they'll spend the entire summer working 
pretty much tw 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doing all of their fishing and they dry their meat and they smoke mm -hmm. their fish and all this kind of thing. And so once they get to winter, they've got everything set up and ready to go and they've got their wood chopped and everything yep. else. Yep. And then, and then they, they got... just spend winter having sex with their sister. Well, yeah, with their dogs <laughs> or, or, or scary, <laughs> scaring the crap out of their kids. Or, or chasing otters. <laughs> yeah, carving, carving random petroglyphs in stone and making up all kinds of stories. Cause yeah. That there's, I mean, a lot of these Inuit legends and stuff. You, you just think this, these are just people that have got too much time on their hands oh, in the winter. Good God. So, so here you go. Here you go. Dreams have played an important role in the lives of Inuit since ancient times, and maybe the origin of certain kinds of myths. They are interpreted with care, right? Dreams with polar bears are said to have sexual connotations. <laughs> Here we go again. Here we they, They're <laughs> obsessed with it. They, they must be. The, I mean, I'm surprised that the reglus don't melt. Well, they, 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 I, I guess if you get the igloo a bit steamed up, it, it actually. Oh, yeah. It give doesn't, it a coat in ice, wouldn't it? Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't it actually help the whole insulation process. Maybe that's yeah. part of the thing. You have to have yeah. a shag in your. You have to have a, a quick shag in your igloo once it's done just to get it all steamed up and, and sealed off. I don't know. Yeah. But also, again, I mean, if it's winter darkness, there's, there's not, I mean, this is also before the advent of electricity and internet. Cause, I mean, now um, yeah. native native people in Alaska, uh, if they, I mean, they're all on TikTok and stuff like that, along well, with everybody else. I, I'm, I'm like the Inuit, a bit like the Aborigines in Australia. You know, they kind of get looked down upon and a lot of them are on benefits and end up alcoholics. Because they've 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 kind of lost their way. I think that I think that's true in um, in the southern United States. The, what they call, what what the Alaskans call the lower forty eight. Yeah. Um, but Alaska had their their native culture was never displaced in quite the same way that um, some of the Native American tribes, well, all of the Native American tribes were. Yeah. Um, and also the Ala the the Native Alaskans they get special dispensation in certain things because they're allowed I, I think a native alaskan is allowed to hunt two seals a year because they use the, the seal yeah the the, the um seal the whole oil. Seal oil. yeah okay. yeah they, they use they use the whole thing but they use the oil um because it adds nutritional value to the frozen and dried food that they eat in the winter okay so they they pretty much it's like a it's almost like a condiment they'll they, they just use it with everything yeah um, well, well yeah because you want to keep the calorific value up don't you i mean it's like mm -hmm. remember what's his name ralph fiennes when he was walking across antarctica yeah they, they tried all sorts of different things you know and test to see mm -hmm. what they could eat yeah that, that would keep up the calorific value and they ended up just eating butter <laughs> yeah you know they just they just uh, when they were walking along they were just eating sticks of butter to keep as much energy and mm. to go in as they could and they still come back with almost zero cholesterol and skinny as a streak of piss yeah absolutely i mean the other thing that i, I noticed from watching the alaska shows is that um children of uh, native alaskans also get a, a certain period that they're allowed to take time off school mm -hmm. to go and help their their parents hunt or fish or trap or whatever um, to maintain the kind of native way of life, so they're not they're not yeah. oppressed in the same way. Yeah, that, I, uh, I I never quite understood though where the casinos came into the Native American culture because of the reservations, <laughs> because gambling is basically illegal. Oh, I'm being facetious. Oh, well then, <laughs> stop asking questions like oh you might serious God. answer them for fuck's sake, Jesus. <laughs> My goodness, what you like? Ah, oh, just stop. Well, Ray says all Alaskan residents get free money just for living there, and that's well. I don't know if it's still true, Ray, but no, it's the yes, oil, it's it's the oil allowance. They, they no, get... no, no. The government used to give you a stipend to go and live in Alaska. Because... Oh no, that was that was the, the homesteading. It was called the Homesteading Act, where you basically you would get a, a parcel of land. Yeah. And and money to buy tools and stuff, but you had to farm that land for like well, three years in a row or something. I'll I'll sign up to that. I well, would sign up they'd... I would sign up to that right now. 
Yeah, I can't do it anymore. Yeah, but why not? Because they've only got the population of Glasgow. And this this place is uh-huh. fucking huge. Well, yeah, that's the Arctic National Refuge. And it's loads of untapped oil and gas and all sorts of stuff. And actually, that <sighs> that land is it's basically kept untouched because it's collateral for US government loans, oh, effectively. Good God. Yeah, because they're going to dig it up and mine it at some point. Well, no, but it, it's it, it's actual value. Something yeah. that it, it's something that you can yeah, it's collateral for a loan. It's like having a piece of property. Um, and I mean, there's plenty <sighs> of mining, and I mean, there's there's an awful lot of. I don't know if you've, there's a a fun show called um, Alaskan Gold Rush or something like that, mm-hmm. and it it basically follows it follows these um, not quite amateur but not quite mining company people trying to find gold. Um, and yeah, so I mean, then there's loads of them in in Alaska. Just okay. even just even just people that go panning for gold and stuff. Right. So we we can't go to Alaska without talking about Nanook. Right. Nanook of the North. Yeah. Nanook. <laughs> right. So Nanook. But isn't is... that Canadian? No. no just, just bear with me. Bear with me. Sorry. Literally. Literally. Nanook is an Inuit term for the polar bear usually plays an important role because this particularly large polar bear is considered the leader of all polar bears. He can right. decide if the hunters have behaved according to the ritual rules to determine if a polar bear hunt is successful. Because the Inuit used to go out and hunt polar bears. Because mm. there's, you know, there's lots of things you can get out of a polar bear that are quite handy. I'm sure. Yep. So, um, so... So Nanook is the giant polar bear, spirit of the the north. But what's the connection with the one you were talking about at the start of the show? Uh, what the one in Portlock? Well, no, the one that's a half half a Kodiak bear and half a polar bear. Yeah, that that's just a that's just a combination of people of two bears that have had sex and produced. An unholy offspring that's an aggressive, large, <laughs> man-hating predator that went out and just systematically killed hunters, and they eventually scared the whole town out its wits. They, they left it. That's, that, is that's it no, that. Is there no Hollywood movie about this? Because it there sounds could like be. it sounds like one. It sounds like a great idea for a, a horror film. I just thought, yeah. The, the what, what could you call it? You okay, so 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 we're talking about a, a naturally enormous, pure. Where does this thing supposed to live? Well, it lives in the woods. <laughs> it's a bear. Do you know how many woods there are in Alaska? <laughs> yeah, but it lives near Kodiak. Right. Okay. Because obviously it has to, because the Kodiak bear, it's a progeny of a Kodiak bear and a polar bear. No, no, I meant the, this... Uh, oh, Nanook? Yeah, Nanook. Oh, no, that's a spirit god thing. That's just that's just one of these. Well, there's another one there. There's Amarog. Amarog, right? A giant wolf that devours hunters unwary enough to go out hunting alone at night. Why? Why would you go out hunting alone at night? Uh, that's very stupid. Yeah. Okay, um, but it can also help humans by ensuring that its wolf brethren keep the caribou herds healthy by eliminating weak and sick animals. No, no, the wolf brethren do that because they want to eat. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. But there's, I mean, there's all sorts. There's, there's the Ilana Lake. It, no, Iliana Lake Monster. Uh huh. No, yeah. Iliamna Lake Monster. Sorry, um, which is kind of Loch Ness monstery. Um, and there, there have been reported sight- sightings of a large unidentified creature in Iliamna Lake, mm-hmm. um, and it's sometimes called Illy, and that just, that just sounds like Alaskans are trying to do the whole Scotland thing where you get loads of hapless American tourists to spend <laughs> an absolute truck ton of money getting to Loch Ness. Yeah. You fleece them from the minute they from the minute they get to Scotland to the minute they leave, charging them outrageous amounts of money for like plastic Nessie plushies and stuff. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, the Loch Ness Monster have been trying to find it for years. But there's also something called a Tizirak, which is a large snake like sea creature from Inuit folklore said to inhabit the waters around King Island. 
and it's described as having a flippered body and a head similar to a snake's. So it's mm. like a bloody great big eel. Yeah. Um, Native, Native Alaskan mythologies also have something called a thunderbird, um, which is interesting because there are some crypt cryptozoologists who have speculated about the existence of giant birds in Alaska. Um, which Really? Well, it's entirely possible. I mean, it's, there's plenty of places where large birds could live in, in the mountains and stuff. Alaska would never yeah, be seen by anybody. Yeah, okay, but, but when you say... Think, whoa, 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 hold on. When you say large birds, how big are we talking? Um, I don't know. Let me find see, out. Right, so see, there's a problem with birds, right? Yeah. Because once you get to a certain size, they can't fly. And this isn't this isn't just this isn't just me saying you know that bird's too big to fly. This is the laws of physics, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, it's like it's like the dinosaur problem, right? There's a, the gravity problem with dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs are too big to have existed on Earth with the current gravity that we've got. Right. They're just too big. They, they they couldn't they couldn't hold their head up. They wouldn't be able to pump blood up to their head because, you know, a brontosaurus could not get blood from its body to its head because it's just too big mm. so so there's a big problem with gravity and th these are things that are really you know science hasn't addressed but has has gravity always been the same because it's also if you think about what well, something like a brontosaurus would eat yeah. Um, and also I mean if you've got a brontosaurus then you'd have something like a tyrannosaurus because You'd have something big eating something equally big. Yeah, but, um, but, but then, and it, and the pterodactyl. There's no chance a pterodactyl these days could fly. It's just too big. So and gravity would pull out its care. Yeah, but at the same time, we know for certain that there were once pterodactyls because they found fossilized remains of them. Mm. Or have they? Maybe they've just been. Maybe it's all. Well, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Ray, Ray, Ray's come up with something here that. It's contradictory, okay, because he says the flat Earth rotated slower, but but that wouldn't work, Ray. You it need to rotate faster to throw you off the planet easier. That's the only the Earth would have to be rotating a lot faster than rather than slower. Right, that so might that might account for it. So faster going, rotation. Well, going back to the Thunderbird for, for a minute. Yeah. Go um, on. You asked about the size. The average account is a wingspan of 15 to 20 feet, so four, four and a half to six meters. Okay. Um, and some of the extreme claims suggest wingspans of up to 30 feet or nine meters, um, or potentially even larger, depending on how much time you've been alone in the winter in your cabin. So how big is uh, What's the Californian condor? How big is a Californian condor? Um, I don't know. Well, let me check. Because um, I think I think a Californian condor is the biggest bird that we have, the, the biggest flight, or the biggest yeah. airborne bird that we have at the moment. What? Happened? Why did that not work? <laughs> right. Okay. Go back to him. You, you, never mind. But, yeah. No. So the, the Thunderbird, when when standing, often reported to be as tall as a person or taller. So some descriptions put its height at six to eight feet. Um, and it's often described as being large enough to carry off large animals like deer or even small whales, which is not, I mean, that's not that surprising because I've seen mountain eagles picking right. up and like I, mountain goats before. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Right. I need to, I need to address this with Ray because I don't quite understand why he thinks this. Right. So Ray says slower rotation would reduce gravity. H how? I, I don't I don't understand that I don't understand how rotation the rotation doesn't impact gravity as if, if gravity is a force it doesn't matter how fast or slowly the earth's rotating right because the gravity will be the same what will happen though is if the earth is rotating quicker you will feel that you will get flung off it easier therefore the centripetal force will counteract some of the effect of gravity. Yeah, but I don't understand if you go slower, that would just make gravity more prevalent and therefore keep you on the, 
the planet more? No? I don't know. I'm, don't, don't ask me. I'm, I'm, I'm not a physicist. <laughs> I, I, it's just and, a, and, it's and just I, a point. I, uh, I mean, I, uh, I don't understand how going slower would make it uh, less. But anyway, right. We shall, uh, we shall, we shall, we shall leave that one for another day, no doubt. Um, mm -hmm. What about what about what's the guy? The one right? The 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 basically they've got this wolf thing. What's the wolf called? The big wolf, the big grey wolf, right? Now there's a good chance, and right. So, so people a hundred years ago were reporting mammoths in Alaska. A hundred years ago, they reported hunting mammoths. Well, that doesn't surprise me because on one of the, um, the I think it's Life Below Zero, mm -hmm. and one of the families that they follow on that is um, the the guys are American. Um, and the, the woman is a, a native Alaskan. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the other things that native Alaskans are allowed to do that nobody else is allowed to do is they're allowed to pick up um, fossils and because they'll find it's occasionally like on rivers and stuff, you'll get landslips and they'll basically reveal um, mammoth tusks. Oh, and... apparently there's mammoth tusks all over Alaska. Yeah. Right, because, so... because, and this goes back to the fact that Alaska was never really glaciated because although it was cold, right? And and this is a good reason for actually moving to Alaska because if we fall into another ice age, the same, the same rules will apply, right? So although Alaska was cold, it was never glaciated because it didn't rain or snow as much up there. There wasn't as much moisture, right? So you didn't get the impact of all the snow that say fell on Greenland, because Greenland's got what, like a five mile deep glacier or something ridiculous. Mm. Whereas, whereas Alaska doesn't. So Alaska was never glaciated. So th if there if there's anywhere on this earth that really mammoths were going to exist and continue to exist, it would have been probably in Alaska. Because they've got, I mean, the the amount of um, the amount of plant life they've got up there in forests is incredible. Mm. So yeah. And and so that leads me to the next thing, which is the wolves. And there might actually be living dire wolves still in Alaska. Well, that wouldn't surprise me. I mean, if there's this is if, Game if, of Thrones it, stuff. Sure. So does this mean there are White Walkers? <laughs> um, let's hope not. Yeah, there's, let's there's hope no, not. There's no there's no wool. Wait so, till we go to the Nahini Valley. So the, the Inuit didn't build a 700 foot high ice wall to keep anything out, which is a good sign. Not yet. <laughs> well, I, I mean, the idea of dire wolves, if, if there's large prey like mammoths, yeah. then, then, I mean, that lends itself to large predators because that's how Mother Nature seems to work. Um, and, and also in the same way that a lot of um, fauna would support um, a large population of extremely large hairy elephants i i mean the, the hairy elephants would support a population of of large wolves and if if the wolves have got lots to eat then over over the course of generations i'm sure they would get quite big right <laughs> I, 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 i'm sorry but the centrifugal force draws us to the center <laughs> i i don't understand that Ray. i really don't if you put water in a bucket, right, and it's not centri you're, you're thinking centripetal force, right? Not so, not centrifugal. You're talking centripetal force, right? And people confuse that all the time, so that's fine. I'll let you off with it. But you put water in a bucket and you tie a string to the handle, and you swing the bucket round and round. Where does the water go? It doesn't fall on you. It stays in the bucket because centripetal force is forcing it against the bottom of the bucket, right? So what would be different from us standing on the Earth and the Earth spinning faster? Centripetal force would force us towards space, not towards the centre of the planet. That's my take. Right. Yeah? So we're talking about Alaska. Yeah, I just had to address <laughs> that. Sorry. That's all right. I think we've, we've pretty much done Alaska now anyway. Mm. Yeah, I think, well, we've done... Parts of it. 
not parts all of, of Alaska. Mean. Some of the weird and wonderful creatures of Alaska, and some of the weird gods, you know, that involve having sex with your sister or and or bears and dogs, right? Well, I mean, they've got their own version of Bigfoot. There's even a pad. Yeah, the hairy man. Well, in 1977, a Japanese fishing trawler allegedly caught a strange decomposing carcass. It was initially speculated to be a prehistoric creature, but um, the science says it was most likely a basking shark, but it's a, some sort of paddled fin dinosaur. And also, there are occasional reports of giant worm-like creatures in, the, in Alaska's tundra. Tremors. Well... You seen the movie Tremors? <laughs> yeah, no, I have seen I have seen Tremors. I was just thinking that none of the none of the Alaskan shows that I've ever watched has mentioned um killer worms that you, that you can't. That, that what about it... the What about the um what about the lampreys that fell from the sky? Have you seen that one? No. So they had a shower of lampreys in a town in Alaska. So you know what a lamprey is? Yeah, it's like an eel. It, yeah, it's like an eel, except it's got like the most horrendous tooth-filled face you've ever seen, because all it does is basically clamp onto a, another bigger fish and suck the blood out of it. It's a vampire fish. It's a horrible, <laughs> horrible, horrible creature, right? And these things fell out the sky, living, and landed on in the, you know, in a town. Uh, did they did they actually land on anyone? They landed all over the town. People were picking them up and going, <laughs> putting them in buckets. You know? Yeah, but that that can happen with like tornadoes and stuff, where you get a water spout that picks. Oh yeah, it can. happens yeah. to pick loads of fish up, yeah. and then and then they get transported via wind and atmosphere. But they don't generally turn up alive. Yeah, well, they don't. that that is weird. Yeah, and. Oh, there's just right. So, um, if you want to watch a movie, why don't you go and watch The Fourth Kind? That's set in Alaska, right? That's set in Nome, Alaska. And it's based on well, I, I can't say a true story, but it's based on anecdotal evidence of people right. that said these things happened to them, you know. So, it's a kind of UFO type alien, okay, thing. Oh, maybe yeah. you should seek that out. The what fourth, was the name of, the, the name fourth of... kind. Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind, basically, but it's just called the Fourth Kind. Two thousand and nine. Yeah, because um, Ed, 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 I think Ed's going to join me on Saturday night as we discuss the movies and the TV we've watched this week. Yes, I'll have to confirm it with you tomorrow just to make sure I have. Yeah, to yeah, there's myself. no problem. You, it, he'll either he'll either be there or, or he will not. I'm 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 hoping to be. The plan the plan is to be unless of unless I've been an idiot and double booked myself. No problem, no problem. Right, so yeah, so Alaska is um it, like its like its massive size, which and remember. Alaska has doubled the disappearance rate of the rest of the continental United States, probably with good reason. So, well, yeah, because yeah, because like its massive size, it's full of of interesting and very varied myth, lore, and cryptids, and also some really interesting people. Because I mean, just looking at Inuit culture and and stuff, the the way, the the mechanisms that they have for survival in that environment yeah. it's absolutely yeah. fascinating um and the place itself has still has very much unspoiled wildernessy kind of mm -hmm. aspect to it where where men can go and be real men and chop wood and kind of yeah. have a homestead and all this kind of stuff i'm a lumberjack and i'm okay <laughs> <laughs> oh dear let's not start on uh, uh, Gay lumberjack Monty Python, Python song. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Although I think he was actually a trans lumberjack. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's not go there. Okay. Um, I don't think. I don't think we really need to. Um, no. <laughs> to, sorry, to look I'm sorry. I that. brought it up. Yeah. Yeah. You say so you should be, mate. So you should be. Right. Um, um, so are we done? Are we done with Alaska? Is Alaska boom? Well, yeah, I think that's part Alaska. of Alaska's done. 
I think I think we need to come back to Alaska, but because there's the whole Alaska Triangle, um, Fair, uh, Elm, Elmendorf. Well, maybe we should do a show about the different triangles. Well, like yeah, the, but the Bermuda yeah, Triangle, the Alaska yeah. Triangle. See if that can there's be a Japanese one as well, isn't there? Yeah, I think I think there are others where, where yeah. weird, weird shit happens. Yeah, yeah. There's that bit in the, in South Africa as well, you know, off the coast of South Africa where ships disappear, but I think they find out why. Because there's two big massive ocean currents meet mm. and, and apparently it can throw up it can throw up a once in a hundred year wave like twice a month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well yeah, the Cape Cape of Good Hope they didn't they didn't name it because it was filled with hope. No, they were hoping that you could get rained <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, yeah, this the Southern Ocean is not somewhere that you it's not certainly not for the oh. faint hearted. No, no it's not. The Southern Ocean. Right. Well, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go on. No, I was just going to say, if we're talking about the Southern Ocean quickly, there's, I was just seeing that um, shipping companies are having all sorts of problems. There's some crazy videos on Facebook of um, shipping containers, mm -hmm. like rows of shipping containers falling yeah. off, of, off of these ships that are, that are basically having to go around um, the Cape because we've got sandals. Oh, because sandal Sandal wearing Houthis armed with ho home homemade missiles yeah. are, are basically making the the mighty yeah, you American think, and British navies look like idiots. You think those <laughs> missiles are homemade? You are having a no. Laugh. I'm just I'm just joking. No, they were made out of washing machines, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah, washing machines and tumble dryers. Yeah, <laughs> that, that reminds me. I was I was watching something once. It was a while ago, but it was like this this company was doing some data mining, and they they came. It was like Philips or something, and they came across this really weird spike in their data where people in India were buying their twin tubs, right? Like they were going out of fashion. And they couldn't figure out why they were selling so many twin tubs to India, so they sent a guy out there, right? And he went out and he started tracking down where these twin tubs had gone. And some places had bought like 15 or 20 twin tubs. And he would go along and they'd all be there running away, going, <laughs> making lassie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. But anyway. Uh, madness, you just, right. Don't eat street food in India, people. Just don't do uh, it. <laughs> just don't do it. No, it's, I don't know if John is still listening, but he's had some very bad experiences with Indian food. Oh yeah, don't, don't, don't. In fact, yeah, Indian food. Lassie, L A double -S, S I, is a yogurt-based drink. Yeah, like mango lassi, it's nice. Mm -hmm. oh. Right. I think we're done. Oh, Are we done? Yeah, I think we're done. Yeah, I think John enjoyed it. India Street Food is fine. He just wants other people to share his misery <laughs> <laughs> and not his toilet. <laughs> <laughs> if well, you're going to eat Indian Street Food, here's a tip from me. Put a toilet roll in the fridge first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. And, and I mean, the amount of chilli and stuff Oh, oh no, yeah. don't even. Right. I hope you enjoyed our little journey to Alaska. I did. It's been great as always for me. Me too. It's been fun. I, and um, we'll see you again next Thursday. And I don't know what we're talking about next Thursday, but we'll come up with something. We'll come up with something as we always do. Because as they say, it's been great for you. Hey, 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 good evening, everyone. It's me and Ed, and we're here to entertain you with the lizard people. <laughs> lizard people. How um, are you, Ed? Few, I'm good, thanks. There's, there's, there's a few people that have been asking for this one for a while. So oh, there are. There are. Happy How's surprise. Ed's volume? Does he need to turn it up? Turn it up, Ed. Turn it up. <laughs> 
Ah, uh, you are a strange, ritualistic Scottish man. You know that. <laughs> ritualistic. <laughs> well, you have your little rituals, so that makes you rit- ritualistic. Yeah, that's positive. They do. <laughs> but you have to have something to keep you sane in this utterly <laughs> insane world of ours. I mean, yeah, and, no. oh, look, another another week, another giant pile of. Uh-huh. Oh, just... uh-huh. 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 <laughs> but I yeah, think it, I, I don't know. Uh-huh. I don't know if it's uh-huh. the moon. I don't know if it's the full moon or something. But everything has <sighs> felt very strange for a few days. It's not been. It's. it's uh, Is that a full moon? Yeah, we we well we just gone full moon. It's oh, uh, right. we're, we're now on on the other side. But the, the full been, moon. It's been weekend. cloudy cloudy here over an evening and um so i've not seen the full moon in fact it's been very dark i thought yeah the, the mics the, are drawing in <laughs> well thank god for that because it means the bloody girls don't wake me up so early in the morning all my neighbors which is the latest uh i'm not even yeah there. It, I, just I made, know. it just I, made me depressed <laughs> i saw that mate i saw that don't worry about it right okay so we've got we've got a good um we got a good Good attendance in the troll room tonight. We've got Shalini, Beats and Tapes, Brett Might, uh, Johnny and John, Amy and Dystopia, Ray. Oh, who else we got? Uh, we get everyone in tonight. Yeah. Yeah, right. Let's let us let us crack on then. Let's crack on. So, <coughs> excuse me. Excuse have me, you, have everyone. Have you got a bit of uh, throat runner there? No, no, not at all. Right. So let's um let's go with um let's go with Los Angeles. We'll start with Los Angeles and the strange catacomb city that's underneath the modern day Los Angeles. That was allegedly discovered by this guy he's called Schufeld. So a article came out in the LA Times round about nineteen thirty four. Lizard people's catacomb city haunted. So this guy, Schufeld, claimed that once he'd mapped it... He'd, so, sorry, where are we? Right. War, a mining engineer named G. Warren Schufeld, he claimed to have developed a radio X-ray that showed a series of underground tunnels beneath Los Angeles, which he mapped out. He believed there was gold there. Right? So... Lizard people's catacomb city hunted. Engineer sinks shaft under Fort Moore Hill to find maze of tunnels and priceless treasures of legendary inhabitants. And busy Los Angeles, although little realizing it in the hustle and bustle of modern existence, stands above a lost city of catacombs filled with incalculable treasures <laughs> and imperishable records of a race of humans. Humans? further advanced intellectually and scientifically than even the highest type of present-day peoples. In the belief of G. Warren Schufeld, geophysical mining engineer, now engaged in an attempt to wrest from the lost city deep in the earth below Fort Moore Hill the secrets of the lizard people of legendary fame in the medicine lodges of the American Indians, specifically the Hopi tribe. More about them later. Yeah, indeed. So firmly the Schufeld and little staff of assistants believe that a maze of catacombs and priceless golden tablets are to be found beneath downtown Los Angeles that the engineer and his aides have already driven a shaft 250 foot deep into the mound of earth. <laughs> you make there it you sound go. so you make it sound so dramatic. It was well, and, and and it was dramatic because this was his second attempt. He doesn't actually tell you that, but this was his second attempt because in 1933, a guy called Warren Schufeld, a mining engineer, had a contract with the city of Los Angeles that was looking for underground tunnels under Los Angeles that were full of conquistador gold. Right. Right. So, so in 1933, he was looking for conquistador gold, which he didn't find. And then in 1934, he has upped the ante and gone with the, maybe a little bit of the um, science fiction of the era. Robert E. Howard was around at that point, Conan and all that, and H.P. Um, and, uh, Lovecraft. And he's come up with this kind of 
catacomb underground city, the lost city, the unnamed city that was underground and was there because the people had to evade an all encompassing flood stroke firestorm that wiped out everything on the surface above. But they, they rode it out in their underground city. But they weren't lizards. They were humans. Although they were meant to be intellectually advanced humans, way more intelligent than we are. Their nine-year-olds were supposed to be of degree level. Well, that sounds very much to me like um, a story of people surviving the last, or a one of the, the cataclysms that's happened 6,000 or 12,000 years ago, most likely. It does, it does. And he had this, um, this X-ray device on which he, wiped, he mapped out the catacombs and said they formed the image of a lizard, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's thought that the people worshipped lizards, but they weren't actually lizards. But he's... well, I mean, we can come, we can come yeah. back to that because yeah. I, I, I did some digging into the uh -huh. Hopis, um, yeah. and I mean their mythology is full of it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. So, um, so. We, we dig into um, Schufeld and we find that his uh, x-ray device that he mapped the tunnels out with is nothing more than a glorified dowsing rod. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's no scientific basis for it to work, um, especially not to be able to look through 250 feet of earth and discover a room full of gold, which <laughs> no one ever got to, right? So it sounds to me very much as if this was kind of like a confidence trick, a scam. Yeah. Um, and, snake, and you have to... Snake oil salesman, as they say. Well, yeah. And you have to bear in mind, this was 1933, 1934, which was the height of the recession, right? So nobody depression. had any money. And, or depression, yeah, the Great Depression. And he was getting money off the city of Los Angeles because he was going to go 50-50 once he found the gold. But he never found the gold. There was no gold. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, he started, like I said, he started off in 1933 looking for a conquistador gold, okay? But, but the, con the conquistadors, they didn't, they, they didn't secrete gold away like pirates. They took it all back to Spain. Yes, they did. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so why do people think that they traipsed across America hiding gold and, and stashes, you know, in, in fact, the middle some, uh, of nowhere? When they, no, they didn't. They put it on their ships and took it back to Spain. Well, you would think that a conquistador that was uh, even suggested secreting some of this gold haul away and keeping it away from the King of Spain would probably have been keelhauled or some some other horrific method that they had to um, end people's lives by then. Yeah, yeah. yeah Sorry, I'm trying to pick. Bit. I'm trying to pick my words carefully <laughs> so as to not instantly get us banned by. Uh, don't the, worry uh... about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, so basically, I think um, I think this guy's been at it, and he's he's kind of generated a complete. What would you call it? Oh, a, a fabrication, really, mm. in order to get some money off the city of LA and spend it on, you know, he's probably been looking for gold on the off chance that there might be some there, but you know what? He's probably just been spending the money and living on it. And to be fair, the guy died, I think he died in 1957 and he hadn't found any gold ever. <laughs> <laughs> no treasure for you. <laughs> well, I mean, par partly you can explain it with the Great Depression, just just the amount of desperation there must have been, mm -hmm. because yep. that yep. that kind of economic downturn is not something that most of us have experienced and have no yet. <laughs> yeah, don't, I, was, I wasn't going to go there, but you you just had to jinx it, didn't you? My God. <laughs> Well, we all. I well, mean, I don't know. I mean, some of us have pretty much experienced an economic downturn. I mean, I've gone from, I've gone from what six figures a year to, I don't, I don't think I even. No, I said it's about fifteen grand or something. I make just now. A, a year, you know. Mm. So that's a big 
that's a big come down, mate. Yeah, I mean that's that's an economic that's a that's a personal economic depression for sure. It sure is. It sure is. But hey ho, I'm doing my best here. I'm doing my best here. <laughs> well, you have to you have to, to, to kind of take the punches sometimes and Well you do, you do and figure, and figure you know out what? how to get up. I much enjoy this than working for the bank. Yeah, working for a bank. I've never. I mean, I've I've always sacrificed salary in IT for um, work life balance. And mm-hmm. I mean, I I basically work for a very small company. I probably could, I probably could get a high flying job in the city if I really wanted to, but I couldn't do it. I just yeah. that whole corporate thing would just it's soul destroying. And then when you also when you're a, a bit awake to what's going on in the world and you're working for some big corporate and you realize these people are basically rampaging across the planet doing all oh, sorts yeah. of horrendous things and uh-huh. you just can't yeah. can't live with it so yeah, yeah. It, it's it's quite interesting though because you get to see from the inside what these people are like and they are just they are just focused on one thing and that is filthy liquor that's mm. all they're focused on and it, it's quite interesting you and in some respects you can sit back and laugh because you know they're focused on the filthy liquor and you're taking as much of that away from them as you possibly can you know? <laughs> <laughs> and and don't get me wrong i mean what was it 60 quid an hour or something you're earning as a free as a contractor in a bank you know mm. i mean well that's what i was on and and I mean, that wasn't necessarily the highest. Um, so you, you earn a lot of money. Um, but they do, they do, um, they do take it out of you. And work-life balance isn't the greatest because most of the stuff, as an IT professional, most of the stuff that you've got to change is at night, you know, when the bank's got downtime because they won't let you do anything during the day. Nothing. You know, oh, sorry, that'll interfere with gathering money. You can do it at the weekend or you can do it at night. You know, mm. um, but yeah, that's, working yeah, that's for the police, destroying. working for the police was a completely different laugh. That was that was a, that was a laugh because the police is a public sector organisation. If you ever worked in a public sector organisation, you know that it's a scream <laughs> because nobody takes anything seriously. It explains why the blood. It explains exactly <laughs> why the bloody country's in the state that it's in. Yeah, yeah and you public, can see that with council, council workers and stuff. <laughs> yeah, and you see the you see the government. You look at all the the politicians, and I mean, they're all all those new MPs. They're all laughing now. They've got they've oh got yeah their allowances, yeah. and they've got their salary, yeah. and they have their subsidised bar and subsidised restaurants. And then um, they've got all the staff, and they've got all the lackeys yeah. in. You know, they've got all their pals in as the staff, and all this. Yeah, it's. it's and a... then they they have all the lobbyists sucking up to them, so they can mm-hmm. get get free free trips to here, there, and everywhere. And yeah, it, it's oh yeah, the whole it's wrong. Thing. It's completely wrong. It, well, it's not just wrong, but it's actually emblematic of the state that the country's in. Yeah, yeah. It's... It's, um, um, it's good, but anyway, tell me about the Hopi then, because what's his name? Um, Sheffield. He he, as part of his explanation, he said little Chief Greenleaf or something like that, or Chief Little Greenleaf. Well, um, had had um, told him about this. He, he'd been in touch with him, but the Hopi live in Arizona, not nowhere near yeah. LA. Yeah, no. Um, yes, I think southeastern Arizona. But yeah. let's just let's just start. You, with yep, a did. little a little story um and it relates to this is um a, it's basically a, a hopi creation myth about their main um lizard person <laughs> not quite lizard person but i should actually be more respectful because the hopi take these things very seriously so i don't i don't want to offend any ancestral spirit <laughs> <or anything>. um, <laughs> but anyway <laughs> Right. Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay. Right. No. Yeah. Just you're, get you're, that out hey, there. One hundred percent. Yeah. Let me draw a circle of salt around myself first. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, you know, just in case. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you got the the, wood, the wooden stake and the silver bullet are handy as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I've got my baton. I've got that. <laughs> 
Oh, dear. Right, sorry. Do carry on, my good man. Please, please do. Oh, um, please. Yeah, no, sorry. I just had, had a message. Um, right, okay. Let's now, long ago, during a time of great drought, the Hopi people were suffering. The crops were failing and the water sources were drying up. The elders gathered to discuss what could be done, and they decided to send a young man on a journey to seek help. The young man travelled far, eventually reaching a great lake. As he approached the water, Palikmana, the water serpent maiden, emerged. She listened to the young man's plea for help and was moved by the plight of the Hopi people. Palikmana agreed to help, but she set a condition. The Hopi must always respect water and use it wisely. The young man agreed, and Palikmana taught him sacred songs and dances that would bring rain. When the young man returned to his village, he taught the others what he had learned. The Hopi performed the ceremonies as instructed, and soon the rains came, ending the drought. From that time on, the Hopi honoured Palikmana in their ceremonies, remembering the importance of water and the balance of nature. Um, that's just a nice little story that I came across that I thought uh -huh. would be a, 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 a nice little way to start start the segment. But it, I mean, it emphasises a few things. First of all, Palikmana is almost always depicted with um reptilian qualities mm -hmm. yeah and it she, it's, she also represents the importance of water which if you're living in southeastern arizona and you're a, a native yeah. american tribe then water is going to be an extremely important thing now reptilians are right they they run right the way through hopi culture it's actually quite interesting because when you start the research the first thing that you come across is obviously the David Icke stuff, which which is equally interesting. I mean, that's kind of what what Hecklefish certainly is talking about when he talks about lizard people. Well, but that's... where do you, where do you stand? I mean, let's get our let's get our cards on the table, right? Where do you stand on lizard people? Well, to be perfectly honest, when I was first reading David Icke's books and doing a whole bunch of research back twenty years ago now. Um, I, he kind of lost me a bit when he started talking about lizard people because mm -hmm. yeah, the whole reptilian thing, certainly mm -hmm. for my mind, the way it was back then wasn't open to, I was, I, cause I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a sci-fi fan. So if you talk to me about mm -hmm. reptilians, I'm instantly start thinking about some cheesy Star Trek. Um, the gorm. latex latex <laughs> yeah it's latex lizard monsters yeah yeah um yeah. but actually we're not necessarily talking about physical creatures although some people do believe that there are actual reptilians in in skin suits and you see pictures of people like where, where so, yeah where someone blinks and suddenly they've got a reptilian oh, yeah, eye yeah. or something like that um so <sighs> But in the last four years, I have entertained all sorts of notions which I'd pre previously written off. And really? the reptil well, the reptilians are kind of one of them. And I'm not talking about necessarily do I think that there are people out there that are actually lizards in, in people suits. Oh. And the answer to that is most likely no. Right. But okay. the this notion of some sort of because David Icke talks about, um, it's almost like they exist in a different dimension, um, a different, it, that people can see, because there's, there's lots oh. of different stories of people who have taken certain uh, mind-altering substances that one can consume in a jungle with tribes. Psych and... Psychedelics, <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, right. Sorry, being careful with me. With yeah, no, that's fine, that's fine. Um, yeah, I have to be. We're not endorsing it. We're not endorsing it. No. Um, but anyway, so under the influence of, of said substances, but there are some yeah. common themes that different people doing this stuff at different times report similar visions of reptilian, dark energy sorts of creatures that yeah. kind of try and suck you in and things like that. And again, five, six years ago, I probably would have just written that stuff off. Like, no, that's all nonsense. But yeah. the kind of stuff that I've seen happening in the world 
certainly over the last four years, definitely over the last six months. It, 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 it leaves my mind open to a lot of possibilities to explain things that mm -hmm. one finds it difficult to explain otherwise. Okay. So, so that's a very long-winded way of saying, I kind of did, but know. I kind of do now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I still don't well, know. I mean, that's yeah, that. Okay. That goes without saying. But I kind yeah, of wasn't, of and I kind of am now. And and it. So yeah. What what about you? Where, where are you at on it? Oh, I'm. I think it's a lot of bullshit. And <laughs> don't explain. Don't, don't, don't mince your words then. <laughs> I, I, I don't explain why, right? Because I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, if we look at reptilians as they exist in the world today, right? Re reptilians have a very limited mental capacity, very limited mental capacity, right? And they always have had. And and we talk about, you know, when we when we cut our own brains up and look at them, we talk about the reptilian brain being this tiny part in the center that just controls the base emotion, not even emotions, the base functions, right? And then everything else that's put around it gives you, you know, some sort of cognition and consciousness. But and I think... No, sorry, I shouldn't interrupt you. Go on. And I, and I don't think reptilians have ever got to the point where they could have evolved far enough to have the intelligence that, that mammals have. I think mammals have way outstripped them. They've outbred them. They've outthought them. They've, I mean, you look at reptilians and you look at crocodiles and sharks and they're still the same creatures they were 65 million years ago, you know. They've not evolved. And I, and I think um, I think anything, I think if you're talking about reptilian entities, right, there's, there's no shapeshifters. This, shapeshifters are a load of crap, right? You know, people people don't, I mean, the, the royal family are not reptilians. They might be evil, Right, and they're certainly inbred, you know, because you know the, the royal families are all inbred to a, to a degree, one way or the other, and that's why they keep bringing bringing fresh blood in, you know, like Diana and and, the, and even even then, you know, like what's her name, Kate, they're not that fresh because they're all part of the same circle, but they have to keep you know the the they have to keep a little bit of diversity going, but um. You know, they're, they're not reptiles. They're just, they're just, you know, they're just, um, what would you call them? Just, you know, they, they, they're intrinsically entitled, you know. They, they have that. that, and, and people like the Rothschild and all that, I think these people are all kind of inbred, right? And they're all diff working in different circles from we are. And, and I agree with that completely. You know, they're on a different plane whatsoever. But they're not in a different dimension, you know. They're just operating on a different level because they have complete and utter power over everything else that's going on in the world. Because you know, effectively, they've they've got the purse strings, and they can pull they can pull the strings and make people dance. And you you can see that when that guy what was it Jacob Rothschild when he poked Prince Charles in the chest. Mm. Do you remember that? Yeah. You know. <laughs> That that's that said a lot, didn't it? You yeah. know, when you can poke the hair to the throne in the chest and go, "You listen to me, boy." And, and I mean, I don't know what he was saying, but you don't poke somebody in the chest like that in a friendly manner. You know, it's basically you you you're not doing something that I want well, you to do. It's think. not it's not just that, but you you have to think that people and, uh, people like the people like the the then heir to the throne. They have security people and stuff around them that are specifically mm -hmm. there to stop mere mortals no, not, touching not, them. No, not in those circumstances, right? This is different. These are the, these are, this is a place where the security services would be, at, at best, they would, they would just be inside the door and they'd be instructed not to interfere with anyone in that room. Well, that's they would, it. Be, they would you, be looking right. out. They'd be looking yep. out. Yeah, but if you or I were in that room, they'd be following us around and shadowing us. We would never be in that, that room. That, well, that's we would the never. Of... That, in those kind of circumstances, you and I would never be in that room. You know, no well, one, the... no one that's not in a circle would be in it. Well, that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and right. So, I mean, there's a couple of points in the um, 
there's a couple of points in the uh, the chat room that I think are, are very valid. Uh, Brit may reptilian is more of a reference to behaviorism of those with a more active com a reptilian complex part of the brain, possibly, possibly. Um, well, that's basically basically, basically psychopaths, yeah. And I think Ray had said that earlier as well, and sociopaths um, as well. Well, yeah, sociopath, psychopath, you know, there's a little bit of sociopath in all of us, isn't there? Come on. Well, yes. <laughs> well, no, absolutely. No, well, there is. Uh, yeah, I mean, there we, is. Because we, we have a, an entire spectrum of aspects of our personality. and they, but it's, And it can also be dependent on mood, because sometimes you can be in a good mood and something happens and you just brush it off and you don't even really give it any thought. Mm -hmm. um, and there's other times where a similar thing can happen, but because you're in a bad mood, um, you, you're suddenly getting arrested for, for thought crimes um, because someone bumps into you and you think you're, you're pissed off. So it's like you, you're just imagining smashing the face on the table or something like that. Yeah. Um, so, but so I, I mean, I do sorry. agree that it's personality. Yeah. So Shalini says, did I see the photo of, um, of Prince William doing it with uh, Keith, you know? pointing at him and shouting at him at the football. But see, when you look into that photograph, that wasn't an angry gesture, right? See, if you look at it, Prince William's actually got, he's got a little kind of smile on. I think they were having a laugh and a joke, and it's just a picture that's been taken out of context because it's a snatch, snapshot in time, you know? And, and without everything around it, you don't get the full context. And I think that's what's happened with that picture. I think it looks like he's maybe having a go at him but I really don't think he has because he wouldn't be doing it in public at a football match, would he? Well, no, it's it, it's interesting that there's been no no video of that moment. Exactly. Um, yeah. Because, because I think they're of, having a laugh. Yeah. Yeah, as you say, it it requires context. Um, and I, I, I like I said, I'm I'm still kind of on the fence about it. Um, yeah. But I do think that there is some serious evil at work in this world now. Whether that's... oh yeah, but then is it is it? Uh, it's not really fair to blame reptiles. I mean, okay, crocodiles—they're not the nicest of creatures, but they've been doing their thing for hundreds of millions of years, and uh -huh. mother, they're, yeah. they're one of the designs that that Mother Nature has gotten right and hasn't been able to kill in all the yeah. various cataclysms that have happened on the planet. Mm -hmm. Because if you think of how many, it means that the number of it's like they outlasted the dinosaurs so whatever happened on the planet that, yeah. that killed off the dinosaurs somehow managed to spare sharks and crocodiles now yeah. that i mean that to me is actually amazing when when you think of what they must have had to do to to actually survive yeah and well I mean, well the sharks probably well yeah I'm, even then i suppose the sharks would be affected because the food supply would be affected but i mean look yeah. at the look at the greenland shark have you ever looked into the greenland shark no right so this is an incredible creature this lives in the at the bottom of the ocean you know around greenland okay and it's like um it's a horrible looking thing that's a scavenger and they've found all sorts of things in its stomach you know so i'll eat anything that falls into the ocean they've found moose they've found you know polar bears they they found all these things in this thing's stomach and they've also found a man in a suit of armor in one of these creatures stomachs right and they reckon these these sharks can live at least four hundred years. Wow! Now you think about it. That's like that's before America was America. Well, this I mean the the, old, the world's oldest living land tortoise. Yeah. yeah, it's not a it's not a turtle. It's a tortoise because otherwise yeah. it walk around on land. I mean that's like nine hundred years old or something. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. That's. It's incredible. And I think tur tur sea turtles, some of those giant turtles actually live quite a long time. Um, and, and I mean, there's there's deep sea creatures out there that we're probably not even aware of that who knows how long they live. Um, but going back, should we go back to the Hopi? Because yeah, yeah, let's do, the, that. The, let's do that. One of the things that I did sort of pick up on about the Hopi mythology is that to start with, they're in the desert. So one of the one of the creatures that 
they would probably see more of than others would be lizards of various descriptions and, sn and snakes yeah well yeah i mean snakes they they kind of were kind of lumping um because it's lizards and serpents and i mean if if i just run through quickly basically the hopi they have their lizard casinos which are um they're spirits effectively and they take mm -hmm. some of them take reptilian form one one example is palikmana that i was talking about earlier um and they're often depicted in um like the petroglyphs and stuff as having reptilian features although i was looking at petroglyphs earlier and i couldn't really see anything that looked much like a lizard but maybe that's just me being unimaginative um but they also have underworld serpents so hopi cosmology includes an underworld and some legends speak of giant serpents or snake-like beings inhabiting these realms um hopi creation stories also mention reptilian or serpent-like creatures playing roles in the formation of the world or in guiding the hopi people um they're also uh, they're very symbolic so reptiles particularly snakes often symbolize water which is extremely important in hopi culture mm -hmm. obviously because they live in in a desert pretty much yeah um and also a lot of their ceremonies include um like lizard representations um so the most, most famous is probably the snake dance which is performed biennially by the snake and antelope clans and in this ceremony dancers handle live snakes which are later released to carry prayers for rain to the underworld other ceremonies may include masks or body paint representing lizards or snakes and dancers mimicking the movements of these animals um that snakes are also seen as indicators of underground water sources and as mediators between the surface world and the watery underworld the shedding of a snake's skin is also sometimes interpreted as a symbol of renewal and transformation which makes sense mm -hmm. um what else have we got here so amy says that kachina dolls they the hopi say they are star people and she used to collect the dolls is that i did didn't come across that I didn't find anything about star people, but it, it wouldn't surprise oh, me. Kachinos. Kachinos, is it? Um, hold on. I'll, I, I, let me see if I can pull up the page. Oh, the page, the page. Where has the page gone? Kachinos. There we go. Kachinos, yeah? Mm hmm That's the dolls. You used to collect them, Amy. Much more than collectible art. Natural History Museum of Utah. Oh, that's quite a that's quite widespread then. So the, is this the Hopi? Yeah. So they actually they didn't just stick to Arizona by the looks of things. Um, I didn't, I didn't extend outwards. I didn't really have time to do anything more than the Hopi, but it, it wouldn't surprise me because the if, even if you go to Africa, um... <laughs> sorry, sorry, I apologize for laughing, but. I, I mean, when when someone so when someone comes up with Ray in the in the chat saying, "I'm still thinking about the armored guy and the shark. What was he doing swimming in armor?" <laughs> he probably fell off a ship. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking he might have fallen into the water, Ray, <laughs> and the shark's gone along the bottom. We went, oh, oh tin tin food now. <laughs> Well, consi considering you can barely walk in those things, yeah. going, going swimming in a suit of armor is not what you want to do. No, not advised. Even just being on a ship. <laughs> I'm sorry, that has just tickled my fancy, that one. Ten foot, yep. <laughs> right, sorry, sorry. Carry on, Ed, sorry. No, 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 it's fine. Um, <laughs> It was just I I did a little bit more well in, in Zulu folklore the Zulu are one of the the major tribes in South in South Africa um, and there's a race of beings in that which are called Chitauri yeah. which are also supposed to be reptilian or serpent like beings um, they've kind of been because. There's a, a Zulu shaman called Credo Mutua that um, David Icke interviewed in the 90s, and so some oh. of the some of the stuff online has basically been influenced by that. Yeah, 
and Chitauri is also the name of the bad guys in the Marvel Black Panther movie. Not seen that one. Um, it's actually a good film, but is that yes. the Wakanda one? Yeah. Wakanda. Um, <laughs> and so it, interesting, they actually did did they did use um, a race of beings from actual African folk folklore. And yeah. I, so it, it it's interesting that I mean there's no there's no connections that I could find between the Zulu and the Hopi, but I do I do find the um, yeah I I I, I do just I find it interesting that two two tribes scattered on different continents could have similar stories about reptilians. I didn't didn't really delve into it that that much further, but well, I wouldn't be surprised because I think. Don't the South American tribes, um, oh, what are they called? The Aztecs? Yeah, and the, what, and the, the um, what's the other ones? Mayans? Aztecs? There's Mayans, Aztecs, Mayans, Aztecs, Olmecs. Olmec, yeah. Um, um, what's the other one? There's another one. Well, that's and, a Quetzalcoatl, uh, I think it's pronounced. Yeah, yeah, the, I'm not, the I'm not flying sure. serpent, the feathered yeah, serpent. That, yeah, so the, the sort of serp serpenty reptile y Inca, type. Inca, that's mm. it. John, John, thank you. That's the one, thanks, John. Um, and it's, I mean, it, it's fascinating. So if we look at the Hopi creation myths, mm -hmm. which involve reptilian like beings, um, Hopi creation mythology often speaks of four worlds. In some versions, reptilian or serpent like beings play roles in the transition between these worlds. Yeah. In the first world, some stories mention uh, a race of lizard people or reptilian beings who lived alongside other creatures. The second world's destruction is sometimes attributed to a great flood, with some versions de de describing giant water serpents as agents of this destruction. Mm -hmm. an emer in the Hopi emergence story, which describes how people came to the current fourth world, there are sometimes mention of mentions of snake-like beings. Some versions describe a giant snake or serpent that guided the people through a reed or bam or through a reed or bamboo to emerge into the current world. Other tellings mention well, snake. Well, that, that, that's Moses. That's the that's Moses in the basket, isn't it? Well, yeah, that's I mean, and it, and it's this. Um, and and you think about it, almost every religion has uh, has a, a serpent at the basis of creation, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, Adam and Eve. Who was a bad and guy? And they all have the flood myths as well. Yeah, yeah, they all have flood myths as well, mm -hmm. um, which is which is interesting. And they all date back to roughly the same amount of time. But yeah. I mean, that's that's just going back to the the, the cataclysm because that's um, what they what they call the Noah event. I think it's actually been properly dated now. It's got Chinese Chan Chan Xing or something, um, which is the geomagnetic excursion six thousand years ago. Um, and then the Gothenburg event, which was no, no, Gothenburg, which was twelve thousand years ago, which was also the the, the uh, younger Dryas. Um, what was the Gothenburg event? Well, it's, it, they're, they're they're just the names given to geomagnetic excursions that happen every oh, six thousand right, okay. years. And, so, and, like a magnetic reversal. Yeah, well, they yeah. I I think it's named based on where they find the the because they do it in rocks and because you can yeah. tell when the magnetic pole changes because mm -hmm. of the magnetism in the rock and mm -hmm. depending on where you find those rocks in the sediment you can figure out how far back yeah. that event happened or a specific type of rocks maybe i'm at the edge of my comfort zone with with the with the understanding of uh, the science but yeah there yeah. there are basically ways to work out when the when the the poles the magnetic poles on the planet flip yeah, and it and it happens roughly every six thousand years, where you have a minor one every six thousand, and a major one every twelve thousand, and we're on the cusp of the twelve thousand. Whoa! Um, now going back to this origin, the these origin legends. Um, there's other stories that mention snake youth who led certain clans to their current home on the mesas, which is in Arizona. Yeah, yeah. They like a mesa. I think a mesa is. Yeah, it's a flat bat, isn't it? Yeah, it's like a hill with a flat top. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the snake clan's origin. The snake clan has specific legends involving reptilian beings. 
Um, one story tells of two snake youths who led the clan on their migration, guiding them to their current home. Another version speaks of a young man who married a snake maiden, leading to the formation of the snake clan. Underworld serpents. Many Hopi stories involve giant serpents living in the underworld. These beings are often associated with water sources and earthquakes. Some legends describe these serpents as guardians of the underground springs and rivers. Okay, now here's Palolokong. I'm going to... I can't even pronounce this word. <laughs> but it begins with a B and it has lots of dots above O's. Balolukong. No, Balolukong. Yeah, anyway. Um, this is a major water serpent deity in Hopi mythology, often described as a giant horned or plumed serpent, which makes you think of Quetzalcoatl, doesn't it? Yeah, it kind of does. Because isn't that a big yeah. plumed serpent? Well, yeah, plumed. a feathered serpent, yeah. Um, it's associated with underground water springs and rainfall and plays a role in some versions of the creation and emergence stories. Um, oh, what's a Jataravid? Johnny and John says, what about the Jataravids? Is he just, is, is he throwing things at us now? Uh, that's possible. I don't know. Indian reptilians, maybe? It's got a bit of an Indian sounding name. Yeah, I'll, I'll have a I don't know. You Sometimes, think you with, think with, you, yeah, you look that one up. Um, and then there's transformation legends where some Hopi stories involve humans transforming into reptilian beings or vice versa. <laughs> Um, these often st serve as origin stories for certain clans or as cautionary tales. Um, so, where are we? Yeah, no, so that's basically about the, the, the Hopi creation myths. I can tell you a little bit more about the Palikmana, which is their main water serpent maiden. Um, and she's a massively important figure in Hopi mythology. She's associated with water, fertility, and the underworld. <laughs> Um, Fuck off, John. <laughs> oh, God, what's he on about now? Yeah, so Jotravatids are a race of creatures that live on Vitvodal 6. <laughs> they have blue skin <laughs> and 50 arms each. Yeah, fuck Dun off. <laughs> uh, you knob. <laughs> piss taker. Indeed. Keep, yeah. Less of that. Um, <laughs> where are we? Uh, right. See, Sorry about that. So, no, it's all right. I'm just looking through my notes. It's Be just, as your John, friend. John. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been putting up with him for about 30 years now. See, you, he, he grows on you. He's, he, he, does, he does have some redeeming qualities. Like, like mold grows on cheese. <laughs> Now, now, don't be nice, nasty. No, I'm, be just, nice. I'm just referencing my cheese video that I made today. <clears throat> <laughs> Have you seen it yet? No. You need to go watch it. Yeah, that's I quite, didn't have time humorous. before the show. Yeah, that's quite humorous. Well, How are you? I, I thought it was mildly humorous, but some people said it's hilarious. And Beats and Tights thinks it was made specifically for him. In fact, he has given me the honour of of if he ever gets a cheese cave, I can I can run it. Um, I mean, we could talk a little bit more about the Kashinas if you like, which are the Hopi. Hey, yeah, which Not, go. Why run? They go back to the um the like the the dolls we were looking at earlier on. They're spirit beings in Hopi religion, representing various aspects of the natural world. <laughs> Um, ancestors and sacred sites. They act as intermediaries between the human and spirit worlds. Um, there are hundreds and, of different Kashinas, each with their own appearance, personality, and role. Mm -hmm. Some sources estimate, estimate that there are over 400 distinct Kashinas. Um, some of the common types, there are sky Kashinas associated with wed weather, and Christ almighty, this is an unpronounceable name, Angunasomtaka. Okay. There's animal kashinas representing various animals like Koyamesi, the mudhead and mudhead kashinas. There's plant kashinas, warriors kashinas, clown kashinas. Um, 
their seasonal appearances. <laughs> different Kashinas appear at different times of the year. There's a Kashina that looks like Ben. <laughs> it may well be. <laughs> Sorry. Well, there's clown Kashinas, so yeah. <laughs> Um, and cruel. and yeah, I mean they're, they're represented in different ways. There's um, sometimes it's dancers wearing masks. There's a represent... minion casino. Like literally, <laughs> there's a minion casino. Do you see it? <laughs> Down here. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. No, no, no. It's fine. It does look? Uh, yeah, I didn't realize you're pointing that. It does look a bit like a minion. It does. I don't, know if, they, I don't know if there are any Lego Lego casinos. Um, and so yeah, there, there's a lot of Kashina dolls. They're called Titu, T I T H, T I T H U, um, which are not toys but religious objects used for teaching. Yeah. Um, dancers wearing masks and costumes during ceremonies, um, and obviously paintings and carvings and things like that. Um, some of the well-known Kashinas include Tawa, the Sun Kashina. Isn't that one of those? If you go right to the top of that page, yeah, there's one that's got like four of them on there. Oh, oh hold on, I've, I've jumped into a casino that I shouldn't have. Uh, <laughs> bear with me. Right, let's go back up. Right, what are you looking for? This one. Yeah, yeah, that one with the four because it looks like it's got names. Just click into that. And see if that matches the ones that I've got. I'm not sure it will. Uh, it's not opening. Why is it not opening? All right, hold on. Ah, there, uh, yeah, the names are ET657.4. <laughs> right, anyway. <there's... laughs> and ET657.2. Oh, right, okay, six five that, seven point two. <laughs> um, a lot. I mean, a lot of the things with Kashina seem, <laughs> seems connected to rain and harvests and food which would make sense yeah um but yeah i mean it, it's apart from the fact that they take a reptilian form it's they, i mean they're, they're, they're basically just kind of pagan gods effectively um in a similar sort of sense that the romans and the greeks had yeah. loads and loads of gods yeah, I think so. Um, I think and so. I'm not sure if, the, if, if they necessarily, because they don't, they're not referred to as gods. But yeah, I, I, they, I, I don't get the impression that they're meant to be representative of real entities. I think they're just, you know, things that they've kind of dreamt up. I had a really weird dream last night. Okay. I, it was really weird in that uh, I was living and working and all that and doing stuff. And see, when I woke up, and it felt like I'd been there for months, right? And see, when I woke up, I thought, holy shit, that seemed so real. It was as if I was in a completely different world, working away and doing different things. And then I woke up and thought, holy shit, that really seemed real. And, you know, I, I mean, when I say it, it seemed real, I thought, Holy shit, that was real. And I've come back now. Sorry. <laughs> but you know what I mean? You know, that's a kind of, it was a kind of visceral thing almost. It was really what? bizarre. Almost like lucid dreaming? No, it wasn't lucid. It wasn't lucid at all because I didn't realize I was in a dream. I thought I was in a completely separate space. I was working. I was going to work. I was coming home. I was doing things. I was going back to work. And this seemed to go on for months, right? Months. Right. I thought, I mean, it was like living your life. And then when I woke up, I thought, holy shit, that's not my life. Who the fuck was it? You know? I mean, it was it was that that realistic. That it was that's really maybe, creepy. Maybe, maybe, maybe you were plugging into someone on, on the astral plane. <laughs> Maybe. And maybe maybe they were maybe they were imagining your life and you're imagining theirs. And they woke up and going, Fuck me, thank God that was a dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, <dear. laughs> I mean that's basically all I got on the Hopi. I've got a I I've got a little bit on the Chitari. What's um, the Chitari? Well that's the Zulu um 
Where are we? Just find the notes. Um, uh, sorry. Beck says there's lots of cases of people who have lived an entire lifetime in a dream stroke coma, etc. It's a really trippy subject. I think it is. Yeah, I think it is, Bex. I think you're right. Dreams. Well, maybe we should. Maybe we should do a show about dreams. Oh, I think we should. I mean, have we touched on dreams before? Because I think I've touched on dreams. I don't know if you were there though. Um, uh, but... I, I don't think we've. I don't think we, we, we certainly. I think we have touched on dreams from time to time, but I don't think we've we've actually done a show dedicated to us trying to figure out what dreams are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. We, we can go into dreams anytime, mate. Because it's like open ended. You could go on forever talking mm. about dreams. Well, yeah, but I mean, there's lucid dreaming and all that kind of stuff as well. So that could be an interesting one. Well, I'm not so necessarily saying next week, but um, I think that could be a fascinating one. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of the Chitauri, there's not, there's not a huge amount, and there are various different African. Um, serpent legends there's a, a, a river serpent um in zambia legends that inhabits the zambezi mm -hmm. whose name that i should know but i've completely forgotten my mind's gone blank the thing um, is I, I i don't think it's i don't think personally it's unusual for there to be separate leg, legends across the world because there's serpents everywhere apart mm -hmm. from ireland isn't there well absolutely i mean it's like where the, else hasn't there any is there there's no snakes. What continent doesn't have snakes? It's probably Siberia. No, it's not Antarctica. Continent, right? I mean, it's well, Antarctica. I bet it's there's no snakes. Probably on Antarctica. Antarctica. Yeah, yeah, it's too cold. Yeah, there won't be any unless snakes unless there. unless there are snakes living in the the warm bit that the Nazis are all in. <laughs> <laughs> Nazi snakes. <laughs> oh, well, if there's well, if there's an underground thing in Antarctica, maybe there's still some snakes there. But the, the, the problem with reptiles and cold is that the two don't go very well together. Well, yeah, of course, because they, they can't warm up their blood by basking in the sunlight when there isn't any. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know if you get snakes in places that, because, I mean, certainly parts of Siberia are not freezing cold all year round. They just get yeah. cold in the winter. Yeah, yeah. But then... How would a well, then they survive? just they, well they they hibernate, don't they? They crawl. Mm. I mean, how do snakes survive in Scotland? That's a fair point. Well, I, I yeah. sometimes wonder how anything survives in Scotland, but that's just me. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, we talked about we touched on this the last time. I think Glasgow's got the same latitude as Fairbanks. Mm. You know, I mean, Scotland Scotland has it easy just now because of the Gulf Stream. If the if the mid Atlantic if the, the Atlantic conveyor shuts down, Scotland's fucked. Mm. We're talking, you know, mile deep glaciers. Uh yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It start, it yeah. would start snowing and it wouldn't stop snowing and the exactly. snow, would, the snow yeah. would fill up all of your locks and the, the, the locks mm -hmm. would freeze and Yeah. Yeah, you guys would be freezing your tits off. No, you'd all be moving down south and we'd have bloody glaciers like starting to stretch their way down here too so. yeah but that'd be all right because as the glaciers started taking all the water out of the oceans dogger land would become available for occupation and we could move <laughs> in there we could become doggers that doesn't sound right <laughs> that doesn't sound right at all <laughs> doesn't sound right at all eh, does it the yeah, first I, thing we'd have to do is change the name a, of the place yeah you're a dogger uh, uh, only on that I live in Dogger Land, <laughs> and it would probably take hundreds of years to dry out as well. So it would just be. Yeah, I'm mud. not saying it would be overnight. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like getting a cyst in your brain. It doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to bring that one up. <laughs> getting a cyst in your brain. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Have you not seen the? nonsense i no, no let's not talk about it tonight i'll deal with it tomorrow okay right okay yeah yeah just you, you'll know what i'm talking about if you're gonna have a look at something that happened in manchester <clears throat> airport oh right 
Yeah, got it. Yeah, okay. Right, I, okay. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I've, I've understood. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's basically what I've got on Hopi. Yep. Well, but I mean that 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 more than does it because I think basically that guy, Schufeld was a confidence trickster and he just made it up and I can't find any trace of uh, little little Chief Greenleaf or Chief Little Greenleaf or whatever it was. Well, the the thing with that is that they can also pick up on some of these um, Native American legends, and essentially just weave that into the confidence trick exactly. to make it all sound a bit more authentic, like this, and also like conquistadors. I mean, it would have probably be I would have been a bit, little bit more believable if he'd said pirates, but I mean, con- yeah. conquistadors just has has this ring of authenticity and and did they ever go as it. far north as California? The conquistadors. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I haven't really paid that much attention to the conquest of America no, I mean, by either. the Spanish. I thought most of the Spanish conquest was in the South, but they did. Yeah. I mean, they they, they did occupy parts of California. So. Oh, did they? Right. Okay. Well, I think so. it's, well, because well, I think part... LA is not far from the border with Mexico. So. Well, it's like the the, the Baja Peninsula. I mm-hmm. think some some of that is. Um, anyway, it's all it's all complicated. I don't I, I couldn't really speak from any position of authority on the subject. Yeah, yeah. Well, we never do, do we? Uh, no, we don't. <laughs> right. Um, so, anything else we want to talk about? Uh, I can't think of anything. All the stuff that we could talk about is all just uh, the shite that's going on in the world, and the people know about that anyway. So. Yeah, yeah. It's like um. Oh, what's all this? Well, let, let's touch on what's all this nonsense about preparing for WW three in three years time. What's all that? Where did that come from? Well, I I I think that that particular military person, mm-hmm. um, a has no idea what he's talking about and doesn't <laughs> understand the situation on the ground in Ukraine. Yeah. B doesn't understand the visceral loathing that most of the population have for their government. Yeah. Um, and C is probably hoping to get some sort of um cushy job with a military industrial contractor. Um, and they, those guys need their they need their money. Um, and. I, I I mean this whole notion that the United Kingdom is going to go to war with anybody is laughable. I mean we couldn't it, it, it just the the whole thing is so utterly absurd that you, you just you can't you can't make it up. I mean yeah we, I think you're right. The, I mean we I think that the army is like 70,000 people or something. Yeah, it's round about 75 something like that. It wouldn't fill <laughs> Wembley put it that no. way. No. And and that's everybody. Mm-hmm. That that's yeah. the people who drive the trucks. That's the people yep. who cook the food. Yep. That's the people who um, do other things apart from fighting. When you actually look at the number of people within the military that could actually pick up a rifle and go and pound pound some dirt and kill kill ruskies, yeah. I mean it's a handful. And and did you do you hear the story? Which is I've seen nothing on it in the in the main, mainstream media, obviously, about a Russian attack on. It was it. They basically claimed to have killed fifty. Oh yeah, fifty foreign yeah, um, instructors. Yeah. Eighteen and, SAS apparently. Yeah, well, S, SAS or SBS. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, but I also heard that because there was an attack on Odessa about a week ago. Um, a Jessa, I should say. Um, yeah. That what, that also I... involved um, those drone boat things. So, I mean, clearly the Russians are then they're, they're taking the gloves off. Oh yeah, yeah. There's, I think so. there's 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 movement on the front, and as Putin said a couple of days ago, they haven't even really started trying yet. I mean, no. they've. They've got what seven hundred and fifty no six hundred and fifty thousand troops that they could put in into the field right now, mm-hmm. and they've got another six hundred and fifty thousand coming through the system. Um, that and and they're shipping T eighty tanks 
to the battlefield. Like, and it's just, and Western media is constantly, oh, Russia's running out of this. Russia's about to yeah. lose. Russia's, they, they can't hold on much longer. And the Russians just keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And essentially doing what they did to Napoleon and doing what they did to Hitler. Just but wear them down. That's well, it. and they learn from history as well. They're not, mm-hmm. I mean, in the case of Hitler and Napoleon, the Russians were kind of, I mean, they weren't necessarily improvising, yeah. but they had to throw a lot of bodies at the Germans to stop yeah, they did. the advance. Yeah. Um, and with Napoleon, they had to burn a large chunk of their country mm-hmm. um, because they just did. Well, the, um, the, slash... that's where the scorched earth thing came up, doesn't mm. it? Yeah. Yeah, and they emptied Moscow out. Yeah. And Napoleon, Napoleon, yeah, he managed to get to Moscow, but he didn't last very long because it wasn't any way of keeping his troops yeah. alive. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and the same thing, the same mistake is being being made again, and this time. The Russians are like, no, we're not. We've done this twice. We've got our history books. We know what we've we're learned. doing. It's not our first rodeo, mate. <laughs> exactly, and and I mean, they just if you you just have to look at one or two videos of Fab Three Thousands yeah. hitting yeah. targets, and you just think that's yes. we're, we're done. Just stop yeah. because you, yeah. they don't even need nukes. No, um, no, they don't. They don't. And, and those things are so accurate; they can basically send it through your window. And then blow up your whole neighborhood. I mean, mm-hmm. um, and why? The thing, that, okay, this is what I can't understand. Why? Why can't we just, the Russians have got vast amounts of natural resources. Why can't we just buy cheap gas off them, drink their <laughs> vodka, get together and all sing, all sing Katusha and shit together? I mean, what the hell? Yeah, I know, I know. Because they're not bad people. Because I mean, the Americans are stupid. Well, we're all stupid. People have been listening to Western propaganda yeah. about Russia for the last 20 years. Because I remember very clearly when they started demonizing Putin. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been a constant drumbeat in the media for the last 22 odd years yeah. of Putin bad, Putin bad, Russia bad, Russia bad, Putin bad. Or not necessarily Russia bad, but Putin bad, Putin bad, Putin bad. And actually Putin's been the best thing that could have happened to Russia. If yeah. you actually look at what's yeah, happening been, yeah. to the Russian economy, mm-hmm. and he says repeatedly, look, okay, when you look at armies and war, mm-hmm. there are there are only a few reasons why countries make war on each other. One, yeah, the, the main one is usually natural resources, whether it's water or food or something that one country yeah. needs that it doesn't have, that a neighboring country does have. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that will make one country go to war against the other. Now, when we're talking about a country that has eleven time zones and some mm-hmm. of the world's largest deposits of all of the different yeah. resources, the Russians have got literally everything they need from rare earth minerals mm-hmm. through to all the food that they could possibly they want do. to grow. Some of the most fertile soil on Earth. What the hell do they want Poland and Germany for? Well, they, they also don't. They don't. exactly. So the the whole notion that Russia is not going to stop at Ukraine and is going to keep going oh, is the most laughable nonsense I've ever heard in my whole life. It makes, apart from anything else, it makes zero logical sense. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, I don't just don't get me started. I'll we'll be sitting here <laughs> sitting yeah, in an I know, hour. I know. Everyone will have gone, and I'll just be ranting, and you'll have fallen asleep. <laughs> right. So, with that, thank you one and all for attending this. I think it's been a blast as always. I've enjoyed this one. Um, I think, unfortunately, I don't think lizard people are real. Um, but hey, that's just one of these things, you know. And uh, anything to close with, Ed? No, just to say thanks for listening, and I hope everyone enjoyed the show, and we'll see you again next week. And it's been great for you. Mm -hmm.